Season's greetings, creeps. Hope you had some hairy horror days and are ready for the funk of 2020 to roll off your shoulder as much as I am. It is fitting, nay, suiting, that I end the year with such a magnanimous discussion with someone I hold in very high esteem, although he would probably hate said esteem. My guest today is Phil Hine author, journalist, I would even say, of many different metaphysical trajectories, from chaos magic to tantra to yogis and yoga to elusive and archaic whimsies illustrated on his brilliant enfolding.org blog. He is a prolific journalist of thought. Hein has a unique perspective more than most in that he doesn't feel he is an authoritative figure on many of the subjects he talks about. I beg to differ in just a small way. He is authoritative to now. To not be pegged and labeled by his past dalliances, but screams growth through his continual need to document and toil with his own stasis as both mage and writer. This means much to me. I told him, not unlike a musician who has put out many records over the years, or any prolific artist for that matter, it was my duty to not hound him with works so far removed from his current, well, currents. I knew he had tired of all the chaos magic gusto sprung upon him from a popular work he released close to 30 years old now. I am talking, of course, of condensed chaos. But let me not dissuade you from thinking this is a chaosless convo. Hein is stunning in his ability to saunter and weave his own growth with his past works. But as his 2020 collection, Hein's Variety states, he is a collection of brilliant and nominal experiences within many currents of magic and artistry. Phil Hine is not the chaos magic guy. He is first and foremost a practitioner journalist ready and able to be humbled by his past decrees and builds a sturdy humanism within the magistrate that is his body of work. A perennial student, humor-laden, incorrigibly witty, and personable, Phil Hine is the exact luminary I needed to hear from at this point in my own trajectory. One riddled with a severe self-reflection that is both transcendent and raw, and one that doesn't take himself too damn seriously. We were weavers of thoughts during our conversation, topics woven like threads through a bright discourse. I'm not one to over-edit these pragmatic conversations as I worry I would devalue the experience that was shared. This is part and parcel. We cover so much, and I'm keeping the spirit of that Congress of Discourse alive by allowing these ebbs and flows. We chat about so damn much from the chaos magic ethos uh, versus the 70s and 80s punk ethos, the psychic soothing of the self from a pragmatic therapeutic standpoint, and adversely, the bullshit of being too pragmatic with the woo, too. We discuss mentors, gurus, and finding the others as friends first, not authorities. The death of the machismo through a fluid concept of sexuality and not their inherent confines. Tantra and its necessity for traditionalism in praxis and his wonderful workings within such a praxis. We discuss the merits and demerits of our international quarantine's effects on the soul. The inherent guilt and subterfuge we ascribe ourselves to do more when we should be easier to ourselves during this unprecedented time. Most importantly, we discuss that Hein, in his varieties, is not Mr. Chaos Magic. He's too much more, too prolific to pin to any certain current, and his gregarious wisdom with many is too refreshing to omit. If you have condensed chaos on your shelf, which I'm sure most of you do, you are doing yourself a disservice not having Heinz Varieties as its companion. But the text works alone. Rarely we get to see the growth and hiccups of Luminary's work so illustrative in their own trajectory. Purchase Heinz Varieties if you know what's good for you. Read enfolding.org, his wonderful blog. And for the love of the goddesses, stop taking shit too damn seriously. Without further ado, slither hither, weirdos and witches. Here is my wonderful chat with Mr. Phil Hein. Mr. Phil Hine, thank you so much for joining me today. It is a great pleasure. Uh, you know, I had a parasocial relationship with you for many years uh, through your works. So it's great to finally chat with you. Thank you for showing. Great pleasure. <laughs> it's so good to finally meet you. Um, your works have been nebulous in, in my life, uh, especially as a 
practitioner of many currents and, and different things. And um, getting your work, Heinz Varieties, this year, which I think came out early, right? Early 2020? Yeah, or late 2019. I can't quite okay. remember. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've told you in, in our correspondences, like how prescient I felt that work is uh, with me and kind of my... I don't want to use the term strained, but definitely uh, odd relationship with chaos magic and my own practices through the years. And you definitely hit the nail on the head in a lot of your own kind of, you know, memoir type writings. So I really appreciated the work. Great. Super. Give it a plug. I wanted to ask you too. So this is, this has kind of been a, a big kind of, toil and trouble with me uh, through the years is uh, kind of defining chaos magic. And I was wondering if you now through, you know, your works from the 80s on ongoing and the huge precipice that it kind of stands on with a lot of practitioners throughout the years, you find it to be a bit of a traditional current now. You have to remember, I'm really engaged with it for a very long right. time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. So I've hardly kept up with current developments. <laughs> uh, it does seem to me, though, that there's been a certain amount of routinization. Yes. Uh, people get hung up on things like sigils and servitors, which, as far as I'm concerned, were just, you know, things for people to try out. I never really saw them as, as if you like, chaos magic practices per se, mm -hmm. because they're not, you know. Uh, in fact, it's very. I think it's very difficult to to put your hand on anything that's that's become associated with the chaos corpus and go, oh yeah, that was invented by chaos magicians. I mean, they right. took stuff in from all directions, you know, and said, oh yeah, 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 yeah. you know. And it's for me, chaos magic was more of a an ethos, uh, if you like, a permission to experiment, to mm -hmm. think outside the occult box. You know, I, I think as occultists, we have this habit of uh, not taking anything on board unless it's in an occult book. Right. And I saw chaos magic as, if, if you like, as a permission to bring in things from, from outside, if you like, that occult event horizon. So I was yeah. very interested in, in drama therapy. So, you know, a lot of drama therapy came into my um, writing. I was interested in, in um, improvised performance. That's another strand for me. Group dynamics was a big thing. You know, I was pulling things in from, from outside that immediate occult sphere and saying, oh, you know, this stuff might be useful. Or yeah. Um, you've stated in Heinz uh, Varieties that, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's uh, the ethos of kind of like the punk rock ethos of like the 70s and 80s was a bit overstated when it came to kind of a chaos magic ethos. Can you explain well, that? One? Well, I, th I think, you know, this it's tricky because, yeah, okay, chaos magic or what became chaos magic um, emerged roughly around the same time as punk rock. Um, but it also, you know, I, I, in my some of my lighter moments, I refer, refer to chaos magic as the bastard child of Margaret Thatcher and uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, that. <laughs> whole idea of, oh, you know, the individual is all important and there's no such thing as society. That's one of Thatcher's more famous phrases. And you can see chaos magic kind of fitting into that ethos as well. But mm -hmm. I, um, I, I read a lot of academic, I read a lot of academic writing about chaos magic and, uh, you know, they were making a great deal about this, this whole chaos punk thing. And I just thought it's, it's overstated, you know, you yeah. know I mean, you look at, um, Ray Sherwin, ex, you know, teacher, I think, Pete Carroll, ex teacher. These are not people you kind of like think about as, as punks, you know. Um, yeah, at the same time, I think there is a kind of, there was a kind of like a punk ethos in the idea that, you know, just in the same way you, that punk challenged this idea of, of the traditional approach to music and instead just, oh, well, just let's just pick up a guitar and learn three chords and away we go. And I think there, there was that kind of like sensibility in a lot of early chaos magic works that you don't have to, you know, um, do loads of preparation. You don't have to sit and meditate for hours a day or do yoga or learn all the attributions of the tree of life before you can, you know, dare to, to step into a ritual circle. You know, you learn some easy techniques and, and then away you go. Um, yeah, I've always described that. What happens that. to you after that is, is up to you, kind of, you know. 
Yeah, I've always described more of the DIY, you know, ethos of it. But, you know, it, and it kind of ties back into my first question that, like, are we ascribing too much to chaos magic? Like, are we trying to corner it too much? Um, well, people love to, to try and do that, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, people love to, to define things and tie them down and say, oh, this is this and it's not this. And, you know, um, when, when Chaos Magic started, there was a lot of, um, let's say, uh, people say, oh, this is cutting edge stuff. You know, we're really pushing the boundaries here. We're, <laughs> we're going places where no Magus has gone before kind of thing in an X-Wing fighter or the astral plane rather than, you know, your traditional stuff. Right. Um, nowadays, I tend to think of a lot of that as more or less a continuation of what was happening in the wider sphere of Western esotericism anyway. And uh, I think this whole idea that chaos magic is revolutionary is, is a bit kind of like passe nowadays. Yeah. No. At the same time, I, th I think there is, a, a, as I said, a kind of process of routinization going on. Um, you know, as I understood it, um, things like sigil magic were just kind of like, you know, you could describe them in five minutes, then away you go. And mm -hmm. what seems to have happened from my albeit limited perspective is, is a lot of people have come along and made things which, went, which were originally thought of as being quite simple techniques into more complicated things. You know, they've added layers of occult compl complications into things that were kind of like supposed to be quite simple. Right. <laughs> Seems like, yeah, just a very common thread within the occult community. Um, you you started work as an occupational therapist, and there's a pragmatism in a lot of your writings and your own practice, I think. Um, can you explain like a little bit more of how, you know, it, I don't want I, I don't want to say self-help, but there is like a soothing of the, you know, psychology of the self, I think, within a lot of your work. Is that well, yeah, because I, I have a degree in psychology and I, uh. I worked in, in clinical practice in, in psychology teams. And uh, when I started to write about chaos magic, I'd, I'd only been about five years away from that. And uh, I think that, yeah, there is a very strong element that I've, of stuff I took from occupational therapy. There's a great thing about occupational therapy is it's a, it's a multidisciplinary um, profession, if you like. So the way we would approach uh, a particular client is to say, okay, client X is going to respond very well to a, if you like, a psychotherapeutic approach to their issues. Let's use psych psychotherapy. Client Y might respond better to behavior therapy. So let's use a behavioral therapy approach in their treatment. So when you train as an occupational therapist, you're, you're taught a variety of, if, if you like, paradigms to use a chaos magic <laughs> phrase uh, and you're kind of like taught a, a procedure uh, whereby you you take somebody's um, particular issue whether it be a, a psychological issue or a, a physiological issue and you apply what you believe is is the best approach and I think that really colored my approach to chaos magic you know oh, yeah I love that it's like prescriptive uh, for you know different I mean obviously for different you know ailments of the self um, your work with SWAT, the strengths, weaknesses, objectives, and, you know, threats, I thought was, uh, it should be kind of studied in, you know, secular recovery. For even... uh, Well, it, it's something that came out of business practice. One of my mates, uh, he was doing a, I, th I think he was doing an MBA, put me onto it. And he said, basically, oh, you know, this is a, an interesting thing we could uh, use to apply to, to sorcery workings. Mm -hmm. or to you know to any kind of results-based magic let's look at the the strengths of the particular approach we're proposing to take what the weaknesses are any opportunistic um things that could arise and then any threats uh, i think it's i forget where swat originally came from but i i heard about it from this mighty man who was doing an mba and we were doing a lot of sorcery together i love that you've that also made sense yeah, you've also studied a lot in group dynamics, too. So it just it kind of sings to me as somebody that has, uh, how do I put this, like, you know, struggled myself in the past with, you know, recovery and, you know, mental health ailments and all of that, that it would be a fantastic, you know, um, practice to, mm. you know, place in, in people within those, you know, as you said, paradigms. <laughs> well, 
again, that came out of my occupational therapy training because I was right. trained to to run groups. And I'd already been in magical groups by then. And, and what I started to find was that uh, most of the people I was working with in magical groups had no idea about any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I used to be in this one group and, and there would be tensions and issues and, you know, people falling out with each other left, you know, the usual shit. Right. And, and they'd be going, oh, we need to contact the group Egregore and find out what's <laughs> wrong. And I was going like, come on, guys, there's 30 of us here. You know, we could just sit around and actually air, you know, get in touch with our tensions and, you know. Trying to yeah. resolve it actually by having a conversation and not doing some fucking ritual, you know. <laughs> yeah, bring it down to earth a little bit. Yeah. Well, like uh, you know, when I was studying your your book uh, for this interview, the I, I even messaged you like I was laughing a lot from the humor, especially when it came to like kind of the group dynamic stuff because. Mm. Lord, oh, Lord, has there been uh, trials and tribulations when it comes to uh, magical groups in my life? (laughs) Yeah, I think that's everybody's experiences. You know, I think you can do some great things in magical groups. And at the same time, they can really fuck you up. You know, it's kind of like the one feeds into the other, you know. Yeah. And it's hard to think. I wanted to ask you if you if you found a kind of dynamic where there isn't it's it's a mentorless or a leadership kind of more you know in congress with all the Mm. members rather than you know one yeah it's tricky really because i I think that is possible but it takes a great deal of um interpersonal work from everybody concerned Mm. i've been in in groups that have bent over backwards particularly large groups 50 60 people where they say, oh, yeah, we don't have any leaders. And what I find tends to happen in that situation is the people with the loudest voices get to be leaders. But because they're not formally acknowledged as leaders, you know, it's almost like they're not accountable. Right. Yeah. It's so, like, a... you know, in, in any kind of group dynamic, you'll get people who talk more than others, people who are looked up to more than others because of their experience or whatever dynamic. Mm-hmm. And if, if those facets are not acknowledged, then, you, you know, by insisting, oh, we don't have any leaders, um, you can always got, put yourself into a worse situation when you do have formal leaders. Because at least if you do have formal leaders, you, you know, you can turn around to that person and say, I don't like what you did, you know. <laughs> right. Do you find there's like a natural hierarchical, you know, kind of progress within groups? Like it always kind of stems into that? Um. Well, groups go through cycles, which, of course, you know, social psychologists have uh, identified things like forming, norming, storming and performing. (laughs) Uh, I've I've seen that in magical groups. Um, I've seen that in work groups when I worked in in corporate publishing. Um, But because there's, you know, people have this really weird idea that, that magicians are born and not made and that. You know, you can be great as an individual magician, and, and that means you'll be great in a group. Uh, I actually find no, you know, groups right. take work, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there was, you know, I, I the reason why I ask is, that, you know, I, I've kind of been a part of one for a while that we found, you know, less in person, more of a kind of, you know, international, just, you know, publish your art and writing and we'll talk on weekends kind of thing. You know, mm-hmm. within it, because yeah, it, it always seemed to stem down to someone's calling the shots, or mm-hmm. someone has to call the shots. You yeah, know, I always find there's well, a you, you can rota- if you formalize that role, you can rotate it. You know, right? Yeah, uh, I would I I would help f- facilitate a group many many years ago where we we did have a formal leader role, but we we rotated it on a kind of like two monthly basis. You know, everybody got a turn at, at being the big cheese. I yeah. think we actually probably did have a cheese that, you know, signified the, the <laughs> Magus role. Yeah. Did you find that? I mean, did that work for a while? Does that? Yeah, it, it, it seemed to go very well. You know, we um, we, we gave people um, the leadership role on the basis that they could do stuff. Right. So you, know, you had one guy who had no formal magic background at all, but he had a van so he could drive us around. Which was cool. <laughs> and he could light fires in the pouring rain, which I certainly couldn't do, you know. Yeah. You, everyone's got their yeah you know the whole point of being in a group is is to um 
develop each other's skill bases. And actually running a group is a skill, you know, and it, it takes time and it takes work. Yeah, and especially like as, you know, a musician in, you know, the smaller confines of that, I always mm -hmm. find that there's someone that's just more enthusiastic than the rest, mm -hmm. you know. And that's always been a hard thing in group dynamics to kind of, you know, uh, sh share that passion with others. But mm. uh, yeah, but when that when that passion takes off in a group, I mean, that's one of the things I really love about working in groups because you get you kind of kind of like uh, everybody shares it and people get ignited and really enthusiastic, you know. Um, and something I really value about groups is is when people together get together and start throwing ideas around. Right. Um, in, in one group I was in, I actually started to enjoy that process of, oh, you know, let's get together and talk about this and talk about that and have a big argument and fall out and all that, <laughs> more than the actual ritual work, you know. Right, but, yeah, so that, that part of it that seemed to be actually more, more interesting than, than just, oh, let's go in a circle and do the ritual, you know. Yeah, and I've, I've noticed that too in your work. There's a lot of, um, you know, like I've mentioned earlier, there's a pragmatism with it where it's like you, you're, you've, you've said, I think a quote was, you know, don't find mentors, make friends or don't find teachers in the sense of a mentor, but make friends. And that always yeah. really sang to me. And you've had to find that out the hard way, I'm guessing. Um, well, it's kind of weird because, you know, I, I started off in, in traditional Wicca, um, you know, we had, high priest and a high priestess and they were a bit distant and removed mm -hmm. um and once i kind of moved out of that very kind of like um structured space um i realized actually um i really enjoyed talking to other people about the occult this this group this coven i was in by the way they have this kind of like total secrecy thing you know mm. you weren't supposed to talk about the occult to other people if other people started talking to you about the occult you were supposed to go oh i'm not interested in that and run away <laughs> You know, it was all very secret, secret, secret. And once I got away from that, I, I, I realized I actually enjoyed talking to people, people, you know, boring their pants off, going on about this or that experience. Right. Um, and I, also, I think then that's where I learned the value of, uh, okay, let's not take all this stuff too seriously. Yeah, the humor is and, a uh, huge thing. Communicate fact. With, with, with humor and, you know, not taking stuff too seriously. I think that's that's a great way of getting things across you know right because yeah nobody you know you know those people who, who come up to you and i'm in here cold and, 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 and you say fuck it up and run away really fast because they're, they're just boring to us yeah absolutely you, know, you don't want to be bored by this no. stuff. you want to be excited by it and turned on by it you know yeah emboldened and passionate yeah there's yeah. uh you had mentioned um you know that uh we're, we're talking about humor and like humor sorely lacking in a lot of these currents, but I also turned that into, you were discussing creativity itself, you know, mm -hmm. as a huge, uh, probably the most, you know, uh, higher echelon of magical, you know, development is creativity. And I find a lot in these boring twats, you know, <laughs> is that they're not creative. Mm -hmm. There's a lack of creativity and imagination because they're, you know, they're too into the traditional currents or, you yeah. know what I mean there? Yeah. I, I, I think magic is, um, if there's one way of characterizing a lot of the magic that was done in the 80s, it was uh, heteropraxy. Right. Uh, I think we've, we've turned into a kind of like orthopract, we're having an orthopractic turn at the moment. You know, <laughs> people have gone back to say, oh, we have to do it the traditional way, like it said in the grimoire of blah, so and so person, you know, and if you don't follow the traditional rules and it won't work, Oh dear, right. you know? and I was kind of like, I'm not sure I believe that, you know. Yeah, and you've also, but you've also, to you know, your credit have found um, a you know the separation of which currents deserve kind of a mentorship or more of a traditional, you know, approach. And I've always appreciated that with you, like uh, your work with tantra. Can you talk about how you got into that and what your mentorship with that was like? Okay, um, Tantra. I got interested in Tantra in about, what was it? It was 1982. I'd, I'd been on a kibbutz in Israel. Mm. Um, and I came back to, to England and I was living in the middle of nowhere. And I just thought, no occult bollocks, you know, I'm going to have a rest from it all. <laughs> just going to do meditation and walk the dog. Yeah. <laughs> All of this craziness, I've had enough of it. 
Uh, and I started having this recurring dream about Carly. Now, I, I kind of knew who Carly was because I read some Kenneth Grant books in my earlier years, but I had no real interest in, you know, Indian stuff of any description. But I, I started having this re recurring dream and I thought, oh, okay, this is really strange, you know. I was completely alone. I didn't have anybody I could talk to about it. Um, so I just went with that and sort of wrote it down, wrote some really awful poetry, kept having the dream. <laughs> okay, this, this is maybe significant. Um, and then a few years later, and I, you know, I started running around and, and looking at books on Tantra and a lot of them were, were kind of like, oh, sacred sex. And I just thought, oh, where's the ritual? You know, where's the magic? Mm -hmm. I don't, okay, yeah, sex is great, but not interested in that stuff, you know, as in, you know, of course I'm interested in sex, but <laughs> I'm not interested in the sexual side, all the, all the, all the rub and tug sort of Tantra as we call right. it. Uh, I wanted the magic. So fast forward about five years, I ended up moving to Leeds, which was kind of Chaos Magic Central. This was about 1986. Uh, Leeds University had an occult society and they used to invite various people to come along and do talks. Um, this guy rocked up um, and he was, he was doing a talk on, if you like, Western ritual tantra. He was part of this group called the Mucos. I don't know if you've come across the Mucos. No, not yet. No, okay. Uh, it, Amukos means the arcane and mystical order of the Knights of Shambhala. Okay. Uh, it was started by this guy who um, went over to India in the late 40s and became a kind of white sadhu, a bit of a hippie type. Mm -hmm. um, and this guy who, whose lecture I went along to was, was you know, talking about Amukos and their whole approach to, it was kind of like East-West fusion stuff. And uh, he, he made this comment, that, which, which I thought was really funny, he was saying, you know, we, uh, in Tantra, you have this idea of corpse sad sadhana, you know, corpse sitting. But he said, it's really hard to do that in Britain. What I suggest you all do is go to somewhere like the M62. The M62 is this huge motorway in northern England, which is really famous for accidents. He said, wait till there's a, a multiple car pile up and then run in and sit on the nearest corpse. <laughs> And of course, you know, he was joking, I think. Right. And I just thought, wow, I want to talk to you. So after after the after the thing had finished, we were in the bar and I went up and said, I, I'm really interested in Tantra. I want to talk to you. And uh, we did. We we did the whole kind of like year and a day thing of me going around to his house and having cups of tea. So I, I kind of stalked this guy, you know, I was a bit ashamed <laughs> to admit it now. Um, he, he used to li live on this uh, little row of houses on the outskirts of Leeds, and there was a kind of like a green area, you know, with trees and a little hill. Mm -hmm. And I used, to, I used to hang around in the trees and, and wait for him. I'd see him come up, go, coming down the road, doobly, 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 <laughs> and then I'd wait for him to go in his house, and then I'd run in and, and knock on the door and say, well, I was just passing. Right. Oh, fancy meeting you here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah no, I, <laughs> I haven't been waiting for you two hours behind a tree. I've, you know, right. Um, and Andrew, that's the guy's name, he was really, really great. And we, we used to go on like a lot of walks around the green spaces in Leeds and we did a lot of magical stuff. And after about a year and a day of him getting to know me and me getting to know him, he gave me a tantra initiation and started me off doing the, the Mucos training program. Very and cool. That was, back, that, that was, yeah, 1987, something like that. And ever since, so Tantra was, for a very long time, it was just one of the many strands that I was weaving, if you like, on my magical um, crocheting. Right. Uh, and then by about the mid-90s, I was thinking, I'm, I'm bored with chaos magic. You know, I, I want to concentrate on Tantra practice. And that's pretty much what I've done ever since. And so you've had like, yeah, I mean, if, if, if it's almost even to the, the romance of a mentorship. You know, well, it's you know if if you're doing a practice which is really unfamiliar, which a lot of tantric magic is, I mean the texts are difficult for a start. You know, right. even if you've got a good translation of the text, the you know if you don't have a cultural context to which to to kind of like decipher what they're talking about, they're they're almost impenetrable. So it really helps to have somebody who's familiar with that stuff and has done the same kind of like um, magical techniques that you're doing and then you can sit down and talk to them about it you know 
Yeah, and but I, I got to. I do things like oh, I you know, ring him up at two o'clock in the morning. And say, oh, I'm sorry to bug you, but you know, I'm just I'm just having a really bad time. And can you talk to me about it? And he'd go, no, oh, fuck off. Yeah, bring me in the morning, <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> and you know, it's I, like a I sponsorship. Think, I think that's a really a thing that people often forget about. You know, having a magical teacher or a mentor or a guru or whatever you want to call it is it's really good for some kind of practice just to have somebody you can talk to yeah you can tell all your mad thoughts to who, who won't necessarily think you're mad right or yeah like just just breathe deeply Phil. it'll go away you know or yeah. this is normal you know yeah it's someone too I, I mean maybe this is a generational thing too just with the advent of the internet and stuff i almost find that those relationships are harder to come by because they're so abundant in a way um, it can be difficult because a lot of, you know, a lot of self-professed teachers nowadays are doing stuff on the net and, right. you know, whilst you can have Zoom seminars with, with Sri Barber Ebop or something, but, you know, you've got 200, <laughs> he's probably got 200,000 worldwide followers, so he's not, he's only going to do a, a general broadcast, but having that one-to-one -one relationship is, I think, really important and it is actually, yeah, really difficult sometimes. And yours, like, you, it came in a kind of a natural, you know, perspective of 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 a, of a mentorship. Have you, uh, have you done any kind of magical workings to gain a mentorship or to find the others or? Um, many years ago, yeah, I did. I think one of the first Cthulhu workings I did was to, you know, Cthulhu is is kind of sitting in the middle of the ocean, sending right. out his telepathic message to dream Sleep. sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I was at doing my first degree and I wanted to find other, other magician types. And I did a Cthulhu work in to kind of like send out a telepathic woo message to, to make other occultists pop up in my field of influence, as it were. Right. Which and I it worked? Kind of, yeah, it kind of worked. I, I met some people. I met this woman who was, uh, I think she was the first actual practicing magician I met. She was uh, doing a, a dissertation, a, a PhD dissertation on UFOs, but she was actually a member of a ceremonial magic order. And she kind of like introduced me to the work of Kenneth Grant, mm -hmm. and, you know, gave me lots of really good advice. So, yeah, I, I did meet people. You I know, think that's, be... the only, that's the only one that springs to mind, though. Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's definitely something that I've been looking into just, you know, with the abundance of all of this. Uh, you know, the podcast for me is in a way having the vehicle, you know, to meet people that inspire and, you know, glean a little from. So, yeah, it's it's in a way this is, you know, the magical working of, of finding the others, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you a little bit about the Pseudonomicon, which. Oh, yeah, uh, well, it's my favorite book, actually. Yeah, I've, I've, I've read that you said that. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I, uh, you know, I was talking to my good friend, Sam Shadow, who uh, she loves your work uh, within the Pseudonomicon. And, I, you know, we were just we were just kind of talking about like where the, you know, the inspiration came to kind of court this endless, nameless, you know, mm -hmm. Cthulhu mythos uh, and to kind of conjure it into your life. Like where, where did that come from? Um. Well, I started out reading Clark Ash and Smith, uh -huh. you know, and uh, I, I kept seeing these endorsements on the back of his books saying, oh, this is bloody brilliant, H.P. Lovecraft. And I thought, is this Lovecraft guy, you know, can I read him, I suppose. And I read it, and I, I guess I was fortunate. I was, again, I'd, I'd moved away from home. I was at college. I was living um, on the edge of a village next to some huge hill ranges in the north of England. And um, Lovecraft's ideas of, of you know, the, the landscape as something alive and animistic and kind of terrible really, really put the hook in me. Because yeah. I was actually not terrifying. very close to that landscape. <laughs> and uh, it just seemed the obvious thing to do was, was to start, you know, doing uh, magical workings with Lovecraft. And at, at, at this stage, I'd never even, you know, I hadn't even encountered uh, things like Lee Bonneau. Right. This, this, this was 19... 80. So, you know, Chaos Magic wasn't even around at that point when I was doing my first Lovecraftian things. Right. Um, it just seemed the obvious thing to do. 
you know, later on when it got more popular, you get people going up to oh, but Catholic use fiction, you can't invoke fictional deities, and they go, Well, we are, so who cares, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um and uh and when I moved to Leeds, I I uh joined the Esoteric Order of Dagon. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're a kind of uh, odd sect of Thelemic tentacle fan- fanciers. <laughs> tentacle fanciers, I love it. <laughs> um, most of whom were, were kind of the sort of occultists who want to write really tedious essays about the significance of Jungian archetypes in... Right, highfalutin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was kind of like, well, more of it. well, now I want to take my trousers off and do something weird in the woods with Cthulhu type occultist. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did a lot of stuff, um, just walking around, really. And, and that's where the, um, I'd, I'd actually edited a, an anthology of East Order of Dagon writings about Lovecraft back in the, about 87, something like that. And I thought, do I want to reprint that? And I just thought, no, it's really boring stuff. So I decided to do this little thing called the Pseudonymicon. And I was frankly surprised when, you know, people were, were kind of like, oh, I want a copy of that. Because I didn't think it was, you know, I didn't think it was that popular. And then when I came to the States in 95, I found, oh, yeah, I really like that stuff. You know, okay, there's obviously a market here, you know. Right. Um, but I was kind of, you know, there's, there's people have done things like they've, they've stuck the great old ones on the tree of life. Mm-hmm. I think it's really, really tedious. <laughs> um, you know, the, for me, the whole point of the Lovecraftian entities is this this primal thing. They're undimensioned. You can't fit them into any kind of, you know, ordered kind of like system. I know August Dill, if they do that, he said, oh, you know, this is a water entity, this is a fire entity. Said, yeah, bollocks to that. You know, this, is, again, is another opportunity to think creatively about your magical process. Right. You know? I, I love that idea, too, like people trying to cross platform so much or, you know, what we were talking about in the beginning is trying to define it so much, but you, you know, you kind of breathe life into the mythos as, as it were, without ascribing too much other occultic yeah. stuff to it. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, everybody can do that. It's really boring. I think. Right. You know? Yeah. As you yeah. said, it was tedious. Te- I, I met a lot of people who want to join all the dots between everything, you know? Right. I, I mean, Met this guy once he goes oh yes the, the 72,000 naddies these are the kind of you know streams in in some tantric and and hindu um, body systems i want to count them all and that's cool you know it's a metaphorical <laughs> number there's not actually 72,000 because <laughs> the texts say there's 72,000 but there's actually three that matter or five that matter you know right. 72,000 is one of those big numbers that people throw about and he was like no no no, no, no. i want to and he wanted to like create this super huge map that mapped and joined the dots between everything and i was kind of like you're crazy you know right i'm out of here you know so what is it about touching the void because you know that mythos is terrifying there's you know i've, I've called it well, like it, an endless nameless uh you know idea i don't think right. it has to be you know well i mean is there like i find there's a lot of beauty in that that there's you know something saying to you that you wanted to you know work with it and I mm. was your like first knee jerk that you, I think you mentioned that you were, you know, it was terrifying, but something kind of propelled you to investigate and to, you know, to really like conjure it. Um, well, yeah, I mean, this, I, I did this ritual to Yogsoth off and on a hill, you know, right. <laughs> at midnight. <laughs> I managed to scare myself stupid. Uh, I actually ran off the hill, you know. And they put a mate's house at two o'clock in the morning gibbering and he was like i told you this would happen <laughs> um but you know I, I think that's just part of the course you know it's almost like a phase you have to go through where you because you think okay all this magic stuff it's really dangerous and dodgy and you know i do the banishing ritual wrong or someone will come out the skirting board and stitch you right up right i used to i used to you know do that thing of doing the banishing ritual on the astral plane as in mm-hmm. in bed and one night i fell asleep before I finished it, and I was kind of like, oh God, what's going to happen? You're like, stuck there. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I, it's, you know, it's, it's part of the glamour of magic that, oh, it's really dangerous and dodgy. And if you don't do your spell right, then, you know, the demons will come out and rip you limb from limb. And I think that hardly ever actually happens. But people invest a lot of um, credence in that, you know. 
Well, and like, yeah, it kind of ties into a question I had about your experience with Kundalini, the way you kind of describe that process. It, it made me think that if someone was not prepared for such a process, that it could kind of be detrimental to mental health. <laughs> OK, well, um, you get you do get that in a lot of um, 19th century, early 20th century writings about Kundalini, particularly right. from the from the theosophical people or you know if you have a up, down with kundalini experience you'll turn into a sex metal lunatic and you'll try and <laughs> shut everything in sight i Whoops. a down yeah. with kundalini experience um <laughs> didn't find that really i mean not more than right that, well, anyway um and there's this whole thing that the, i think the groffs came up with in the 70s this whole thing of a spiritual emergency that I think that, that got looped into Kundalini. And it's it's just become one of those bugbear experiences. You know, it's like on everybody's bucket list. Oh, I want to have a Kundalini experience, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah, at, at the time it was it was really scary because I didn't have a context for it. You know, I, I didn't know what was happening. Uh, I was having these really intense physical experiences and I didn't have a hook to hang things on. Right, no anchor, yeah. Yeah, I, no, I had no cultural context for it. What I did think, prior to that was oh these things only happen to people who are like advanced adepts and whatever i am i'm not an advanced adept so mm -hmm. you know the the really useful thing about that experience for me was it, it left me questioning a lot of the stuff i'd absorbed you know you read a couple books and you just you're like a big hoover and you just suck a lot of stuff in and it goes right. into you don't ever question it and i think that that so-called kundalini experience because now i can sit back and go well was it a proper kundalini experience I don't know you know it did something for me was it right. authentic who knows it's inconsequential um, if it's authentic you know, it, 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 yeah. it, it, it kind of like shifted my perspective and um, because i hadn't really questioned a lot of stuff uh yeah. by that point it, it started me on that trajectory of going well hang on let's poke this idea and see if it you know what's underneath it yeah, I had a I had a Kundalini experience uh, meditating in the shower in 2017, and I'll never yeah. forget it. It's uh, but like you said, you know, I'm not uh, you know spiritually <laughs> like above anyone else. You know, it was just like through a meditation ritual that I would do, mm. and then it hit, and it was absurdly orgasmic. Yeah, you know, and uh, but yeah, it's like it, it, if if I think you're very correct in saying that, like it doesn't take a spiritual adept to mm. hit these strides, you know. No, I think and, uh, there's a guy called Aganada Aganada Barati wrote a really interesting book called uh, No, I forget the name of it, but he, you know he talks about this thing he calls the zero experience, mm -hmm. which is a, a kind of like free floating. It's kind of like Freud's idea of the oceanic state. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's this kind of like mystical experience, I guess you can call it that, right. that, that can hit you at any time. But, he, you know, he made a really interesting comment. He said, well, if you're an art, you can be an arsehole before that and you can be an arsehole after it. It doesn't actually alter you. It doesn't right. actually make you a spiritually evolved persona. That's up to you to do. The experience itself. Yeah, you know, it's what you do with it. Yeah. You, you need to do things with it, you know. Yeah, I guess it, you know, and it set me on 2017 was a big year for me, too, with, you know, magical workings and blah, 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 blah. Mm. And, you know, it really just kept me on a path of, you know, wanting to investigate it more, whether it changed my attitude or, you know, my my assholedom, you know, with other people uh, remains to be seen. But, you know, we'll see. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I was. uh you know, when you were talking about the, um, you know, there's things like latent in uh, your DNA, RNA structure, um, whether it's like mental health afflictions or whatever, and Kundalini can kind of trigger that, you know, that that made me kind of stop and think. Yeah, that that was me. I think being extremely speculative based on okay. having done a, done a done an elective year year of of uh, neurology. <laughs> Back, I see, in the, yeah. back in the mid 80s um so i wouldn't take that too seriously okay <laughs> you know i, I don't you know again that, that this is what occultists do you know we, we right. read up on something for for like five minutes or half a year or 20 mm -hmm. years and, and then think oh yeah yeah this makes sense you know like it's testament yeah yeah oh yeah and like that's yeah i just i wanted to bring it up because you know it made me 
it set me on a path thinking it, it, I didn't take it as testament. And I think that's what I love so well, much about good. your writing. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, I think, you know, it's, we, we tend to see consciousness as, as a kind of like steady state thing. Mm -hmm. it's it linear. Isn't. You know, we, right. Yeah, it's non-linear. We drop in and out of intense states all the time. Uh, and a lot of the tantric practice I do is, is kind of like making up, you know, creating opportunistic spaces for momentary intensifications of consciousness. Right. I almost write that down. That's, that pretty that good. was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I can, I can be walk, walking along the street and I'll, I'll see the reflection of sunlight in a pool and just stand there and, and be with that. And, you know, my consciousness opens up and my chakras all go bling. Right. Not that I believe that stuff, but, but you know, it's, <laughs> It can happen anywhere, anytime to anybody. And yeah. it's a great thing. You know, you, you can be completely rational and have, suddenly be thrown into a state that kind of like forces you to challenge, you know, that rationality. I've always thought of, yeah, being, you know, practitioners kind of learning to conduct those experiences, right? Like learning to conduct those like singularity experiences with consciousness. Does that make sense? Um, I, 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 well, I don't know that I agree. I think it's giving, affording yourself the opportunity to experience them that isn't necessarily the same as conducting them. Right. So, like, yeah, not having kind of a, you know, uh, a control over them. I think just opening the pathways then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. So, con yeah, conducting the forks, you know. <laughs> but I was... Uh, you know, one of the big things to me in the book um, was this idea that I had reading it. And once again, I'm not going to ascribe my own meaning to what you read or what you wrote. Um, but uh, something told me, like when you talked about, you know, the queering of Baphomet and mm -hmm. all of these other experiences with sexuality, there was uh, you talked about like the the meeting uh, with the goddess. You know, it's mm -hmm. like the this death of, you know, kind of a masculinity uh, and, you know, machismo, I guess, with Hakate and Kali and Morgan and stuff. And I, w I was hoping you could expand on that a little bit. And like, because I see that kind of happening in society at large. But then again, you know, I could be ascribing a lot of shit. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did a lot of work with goddesses. Um I don't know. I just I just like goddesses. Right. You know? Yeah. Um I I I think at, at some stage I had this idea that I was I was kind of like progressing from one to the other. So I think I, you know, I I did about two years of working with ISIS. Mm -hmm. Uh then I moved to what was the progression? ISIS, Eris, uh um Hikati, um Babylon. You know, I did this whole cycle of goddess workings. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was good for me. Um, I think it, it made me kind of like think about how I was relating to women, particularly in my normal life. Right. Uh, suddenly realized how much I've been putting women on a pedestal and objectifying them and not seeing them as, as real people, you know. Did that play into a lot of your, uh, you know, your experience with sexuality? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Because uh, some, at least for some of them, I was working with female magical partners. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't like over theorizing things. I just right. think it, it, no it was a useful um, five or six years of, of rather intense magical work. Yeah. Dif difficult to, to kind of like talk about it, really. Yeah. No, that's totally fair and i find that a lot too about my own experiences yeah. with magic and you know here we are on somewhat of an occult podcast probably over theorizing and explaining things to the death you know <laughs> it's like it's it's my own I, kind of yeah a, a lot of the time i i just started down particular tracks because it seemed like a good idea right and i was I, I didn't have a goal in mind i didn't yeah. have a this is my will uh, to do this. It was an attraction. Oh, yeah. oh, this looks this looks interesting. We'll go down this way for a bit, you know. And if that ends up, you know, ten years down the down the road, going, oh, I'm still doing that. 
fine you know uh, i've never really yeah. pursued that whole kind of like straight path i've i've often i just stray into whatever seems like a good idea at the time yeah i love that that's you know to me that seems more indicative of intuition than anything else you know like mm -hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I feel that way too, just even in creative aspects, because I, I work with a lot of different creative mediums and I just kind of go where the song takes me or go mm -hmm. where, you know, the feeling, uh, the more I ascribe, you know, a ritual and I've been trying to practice a kind of daily magical ritual when it comes to projects and productivity, the more it strays from me, right? Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, it's, you have to kind of just, yeah, follow the inkling. And have you like, you're, you're just an incredibly prolific writer. So have you found like a routine that works for you in that sense? Or are you just kind of following the song too? Um, I write about whatever's interesting me. Yeah. I, I have, you know, regardless of whether anybody else is interested in it. <laughs> right. You, know, yeah. you, can, you can go on my blog and it's, it's, I've done this whole series on this this particular one court case in, in, in 1862, which I think is really interesting. But I, I understand not everybody else wants to read my analysis of this one particular court case. So I've, I've always just kind of like whatever's grabbed my attention at any one point, and, and that's kind of what I pursued. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I don't write stuff because it's popular, because there's an audience for it. Uh, I write about it because primarily I'm interested in it and I want to, you know, get my thoughts in order. Yeah, that's what sings to me most. And I was wondering, you know, with the, like, the creation of Heinz Varieties, which I know is a collection, right, yeah. of, of different works, what, what prompted you to kind of collect these works and have sort of a, you know speak more about you know your experiences within this um i just thought the time was right you know yeah right Forty yeah. Years is, is a good kind of like i mean I, i've seen people who've been doing magic for five years and they've written them written their biographies and I was like, oh god i know yeah seems a bit pre presumptuous and i just thought 40 years is a good point uh i also wanted to because you know people say oh phil hind cast magician and I go, well, actually, that's just like a blip, really. I've done things beforehand. Absolutely. And I've done afterwards. So yeah. I wanted to kind of like um, bring that across in the best way I knew how to say, actually, I'm not just Mr. Chaos Magic, because I haven't really done any Chaos Magic since about 1998, I think. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to show that I had a, I had a you know, a, I tried to touch on a, a breadth of topics. And I thought, you know, that would be interesting in itself, but what would be really good if I uh, tried to contextualize those pieces, say, okay, this is what was going on in my life when I, when I wrote this, you know, this is the result of an unhappy love affair, and it's me trying to write about it in a very kind of like, I don't know, chaos magic -y, hardcore way, and Why? perhaps not really succeeding very well. Um, that was, you know, where the, the, the kind of like slices of auto biographical reflection came in and I thought that was in, that was an interesting thing to do as well because then I could talk about you know you know this is what prompted me down this particular path you know these horrible experiences with this crazy Wiccan cover and this is what sent me over to chaos magic you know right. that sort of thing yeah it's like it's rare that you find a I wouldn't even call this a bookend because it's obviously you know still in the process of your own you know path and and workings mm. and stuff but it's rare that you find you know 30 40 years later you you know someone write about a current and how it's you know transpired since their first mm -hmm. works of it because yeah. you know obviously condensed chaos is on the bookshelves of many people and i feel yeah. it does them a disservice not to have this with it well i would that's that's very kind of good i really hope that Shall yeah. through my next set of sales, sales figures, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, I, but there's, I, there's a lot of stuff that I wanted to put in that ended up not going in because and there were some really awful articles that I thought would be maybe should go in as well. Mm -hmm. To show that actually, you know, when I started writing about this subject, I had no fucking idea what I was on about whatsoever. And this is the crap I came out with. Uh, in the end, I decided not to do that apart from that stupid book you know that child writing for marius which is which i want to ask yeah totally wince wince making you know but it was mm -hmm. kind of 
personally important for me. So that's why it, it got left in, you know. Yeah. Wait, can you uh, describe your, your channeling experience with the stupid book? Uh, well, yeah, it's very simple. I've, I've done a lot of Aris workings. Uh-huh. Uh, I've done an Aris working with the magical partner. And then about a week later, I'd done a big Aris working with the coven I was in. So I was still Wiccan, pretty right. much. Uh, and then I was literally sat on this train station early one morning, have, or whenever it was, having a beer. And it just popped into my head. So I, I wrote it down. See, I love I that. I, I yeah. might have editorialized it later, you know, slightly. Sure. Yeah. And, and there's there's bits of it where you say, oh, God, I'm, this is just really, you know, terrible sub-Crowley stuff, you know. But it, I'll say it was, it was personally important for me. And I, you know, it became a kind of like personal touchstone for a, a, at least a year. Um, very erudite. I, I, was, I was very, well, I don't know about that, but it was, it, so I was very, <laughs> very into Eris. Eris was kind of like my bridge between Wicca and, and Chaos Magic. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say the, you know, I think there's a lot of prescription. When I, when I talk to other people that have channeling, you know, experiences and stuff, there's a lot of pomp and pomposity. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> with it, if you, would, if you attract a couple of hundred thousand followers and sell them books and right. videos and t-shirts for the rest of your life, then I guess you need that pomposity. You know, me, I couldn't do that. You know. So it was just in one kind of foul swoop. You just, you yeah, just basically. Wrote it. You know, yeah. I just wrote it down. You know, like bad poetry. It all came spilling out of me. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's, you know, you here. I am. I'm wanting to, you know say oh yeah it's kind of like the spare automatic writing stuff but even that is you know well I, I i did do a lot of automatic writing right uh because i was at one point i worked for this this bookshop that was owned by a spiritualist company a lot of spiritualists were really into automatic writing in the 19th century so i just played around and i've got a whole grimoire somewhere that's just full of, of automatic writing and you know um, Barosian gut ups and stuff like that, you know, and I think that could be really good for your creative process, yeah, absolutely. No, do just... you, I'm sorry, I was just gonna Go ask on, if, if you, uh, you know, because of how fluid you are as a writer, that it's tuned more in that, in that sense, in that medium. Um, I, th- I think my writing style has changed, but I, I you know, I used to, I used to write under pseudonyms. Right. So I've, I've written a lot of stuff. I've almost like created these fake personas and started writing stuff under And that can become very creative because that's, it's a bit like one of those uh, Stanislavski exercises where you right. imagine yourself to be another person. You can like create a biography for that person and attempt to kind of like get into that method person's acting. head. Yeah. Uh, yeah, method acting. And then you, you write from that perspective. Um, yeah. I once created this, this guy who'd been a, He'd been a rationalist until the uh, till the end of the first second world war when when the atomic bomb was dropped and that caused him to lose his his faith in religion. He became a satanist after that, and uh, he joined some weird kind of like satanist group in in Hampshire in the early nineteen fifties. And I had a whole biography of this guy, and I kind of like really got into it. And I started writing a, a book on on satanic practice. Uh, out of out of his experiences, if you like. Uh, unfortunately, I had a hard disk crash, so I lost the whole fucking thing. Oh, but, I'm sorry to hear you know, that. The, his, his, his idea was that the most satanic thing you could do was to mind your own business. <laughs> you know, if it. you really think other people don't matter, then you know, minding your own business is really satanic. And I just thought, yeah, that would be an interesting thing to play with, you know. Yeah. You know, instead I of this... running around the internet upsetting people, just <laughs> get on with it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, the forum world. Yeah, I, um, you know, I do that too uh, under uh, different musical pseudonyms or, you know, for a while uh, before I quote unquote came out of the broom closet, as they say, you know, mm-hmm. I was uh, writing for Disinfo under a pseudonym and. Oh, really? You know, Who were you then? Uh, Rebel Roz. Um, uh, doesn't ring yeah, it was, it's in the, it's, it was in the later years. I was there yeah. to see it, see Disinfo fall, basically. Okay um with dad mccracken as as the uh editor yeah uh but we, we uh, involved in that thing that jason loved it 
I I know Jason, but uh, no, I I don't have any direct like workings with him or or anything. Uh, oh, you okay. mean the the Book of Lies? Is that what whatever that thing is he edited? Yeah, yeah, that was the Book of Lies. Actually, that was a very uh, prominent source for me uh, in my youth. That kind mm-hmm. of really set me on a path because you know it had Genesis, P. Orridge, and you know, Austin writings on Austin Osmond Spare and Alan Moore and Grant Morrison and Robert Anton Wilson. So it was, uh, it was definitely an inspiration for me. Mm-hmm. And so it was, uh, a self, you know, high five when I got to write on the blog for Disinfo. Uh, yeah. cause that was like a full turnaround. What I meant with the pseudonym thing, just to finish that up was, mm-hmm. you know, I was writing under different names, uh, with when it came to magical experiences and stuff, you know, kind of, hidden in a way right under a different Mm -hmm. character and i actually talked to mitch horowitz a couple years ago now and you know he he was very certain that it's like it's time to come out of the broom closet just use your name (laughs) you know and so that's really helped me too just uh, with accountability wise but i still Mm -hmm. use pseudonyms and other creative practices and stuff somebody once said to me uh, I've, I've written an article for Cares International under one of these pseudonyms, and uh, a friend, a mate of the editor, came up to him and said, that, "You know, this guy's a much better writer than Phil Hind. You should get <laughs> more from this guy and less from Phil Hind. He's a much better writer." And, and the editor of Cares International said, "He doesn't know that's you as well." I'd be like, ha, 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 ha. "That's hilarious." You know? Yeah, that's yeah. when you know it's it's yeah you're you're doing you're doing good work. <laughs> you can be better than yourself under a pseudonym mm-hmm. you know but yeah we were uh i did bring up the querying of baphomet and mm-hmm. you know uh i have many trans queer friends that are big fans of you oh, uh, and awesome. and you know your 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 writings on sexuality and especially mm-hmm. within magical currents and can you describe what that querying of baphomet was that possession for listeners um i i i think what you see in there is partly my engagement with a queer theory and b uh continental philosophy so like deleuze and guattari mm-hmm. big element of it there but uh, i mean I, i've done a lot you know like i say in that article i've done a lot done a lot of work with baphomet i invoked baphomet when i was in wicca i'd done loads of chaos mass bees when i was in the iot um but the, the queer, there was this uh, event in, in Britain that started up, I think, in the late 90s and ran on to, until the early 2000s uh, called Queer Pagan Camp, which was like a, a, pag, a pagan camp just for queer people. I mean, you self-defined queer, you know, you don't right. care about your actual sexual orientation. If you define as queer, you go to Queer Pagan Camp. And... Um, I was sitting around one day and I was approached by two friends. So we want to do a Baphomet ritual. And I was like, okay, I'm up for that, you know. Um, but there, there was something kind of strange about the dynamics because we were we we had a kind of we were doing it inside a marquee. So I was I was on grass. Now, if you've ever done possession on a hard cold stone floor or in a house, it's a totally different space. And <laughs> right. um, as as we prepared for the ritual, and I was kind of like getting myself possessed as a as a kind of almost before the ritual happened, you know, I was kind of like working myself to an agnosticated state. Um, I thought this this is going to be really intense. I can just feel it. You know, this this is going to be a good one. Um, and I had this friend there, and I said to her, "Look, some of the, one of the things that happened at Queer Peck and Camp that I thought was really good was they had a really strong emphasis on." Um, safekeeping people right i'd never really come across this idea before i'd seen people do rituals um you know after the ritual you might get somebody who's a bit out of it and people run up to them and go you're all right which is right the last thing it's kind of like a I brown think, acid tent kind of thing yeah so <laughs> uh, but queer, queer peg and camp they, they developed this whole kind of like if you like technology about safe keeping people and what i after i was talking with some people about this i thought actually this is a really good idea this is something i'd like to see done in a lot more you know um non-queer spaces because the, i think the thing is that 
if you know there's somebody who's going to help you and uh, protect you whilst you're either emotionally or physically or vulnerable, it actually frees you to go into a much deeper possession. Right. Know? And I, there was this uh, friend of mine there who I'd known for a quarter of a century. And I was like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen when I get possessed by Benef Baphomet, but will you look after my body? That's one right. thing. You know, make sure it, you know, nothing bad happens to the body whilst it, I've gone away somewhere. So that was one thing. And the other thing is, will you bring me out? Because I sometimes have real difficulties coming out of a possession trance. But knowing that I had that person there to like a guard my body and b bring me out made it a, a really deep experience. And um, you know, one minute I was in a circle of people who were all kind of like like baff a bit, baff a bit, baff a bit, baff a bit in that classic, you know. Chaos must be right. kind of way. And the next minute I was gone somewhere. And what I could get was like fragmentary recollections. So there was one point in the ritual where I felt I was crawling around a, a forest. And I asked people afterwards, I said, well, you know, what, where, where did all those trees come from? Because we were in the middle of this huge market. And they said, no, you were, you were actually on the floor crawling around people's legs. Whoa. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, okay, I, I can see that. So and it was, was a, a true out of like yeah, it was, I a was true. complete. Yeah, I can kind of like fragmentary bits where and there was another bit where I could remember I saw all this light and I was really attracted to this all these bright shiny objects, and again people were saying yeah you you had you had this huge altar so you moved towards the altar and you started sticking your fingers in the candles so we kind of like pulled you back from that. <laughs> we didn't really want you to burn yourself, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it, it was a really intense experience. I think it's one of the deepest uh, possessions I've ever had. And, you know, it, it took a long time with many illustrations of water and people gentle calling my name so, for me to come out of it. And when I did, I was completely like emotionally exhausted and vulnerable and everybody else had a really great party. And I spent the rest of the night in, in somebody's tent being you know, <laughs> hugged basically and fed hot chocolate. Yeah. You know, it reminds me too. It's there's a uh, is it a grounding thing afterwards? Because I was a part. I have a like second generation, third generation, uh, hoodoo practitioner friend, and mm -hmm. they let me uh, part of this ritual, and um, it was one of the most like transitory experiences I've ever had. Um, mm -hmm. and it I got sick for like nine days yeah. after it. And you know they were saying, "Oh, it's because we didn't you didn't ground properly." Is that is that something you've? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's like this whole thing about banishing, right? You know, you do a ritual and then you banish all the forces afterwards, and then you you go off into your normal life. It kids, it seems a waste, you know. Um, <laughs> If yeah, I'm just to be kind of clean and rid of it. To a really intense state of consciousness, uh, I don't necessarily think that that should be grounded. You know, let's just see where it, it takes you. Right, hang on to I, it. I did a Carly uh, working one year at QPC, and I felt Carly was walking beside me for the rest of the week. Wow. You know, like literally two steps in front of yeah, me. Yeah, why would you want to banish yeah. that? Why, why would you want to ground from that? You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, it goes away eventually, you know. Right. Um, I, I've seen people go, oh, you know, it's easy to, to get into those altered states and then blame all kinds of strange behavior, which is actually your strange behavior on, on the possession state or whatever. But actually, you know, there might be there might be grounds for grounding in some cases. Right. But I think the problem is, is, you know, you get in a rut and you say, oh, I have to do this and this and this and this. And then that limits you and what I've always been interested in, in in whatever magical path I've been you know careering down is let's just explore stuff you know let's not take things as as canonical let's right. play around with stuff you know I find that a lot of people uh kind of turn to magical practice through lapses of you know faith or you know, they're going through, you know, hard times and whatnot. Do you think that like yeah. kind of ordains their, you know, experience with it in a way? Um, I, I, it's tricky because I think, you know, I, I look back at my own experience and think the actual things that got me interested in magic were not the things I thought they were. 
You know, right. it took a, a lot of um, self ref reflection and self exploration and, and, and a degree of maturity to actually discover that the things that I thought were the things that got me interested in magic weren't actually the important things, you know, right. uh, without really wanting to go into some really personal stuff here. Sure. But, um, you know, people come into magic for all kinds of reasons, you know, but I think a, a very common one is they want to feel a, a sense of agency that they perhaps lack in other parts of their life, as, as yeah. though they have some control over what's happening to them. Very yeah. interesting at the moment, because of course, we, we, you know, we, we have very little control over what hap is happening to us. I was going to say, absolutely, yeah, pressing to these times, you know, um, I, your book came out, um, you know, in 2020, and mm. <laughs> have you noticed? I was, I was lucky. I, I missed lockdown. You know, I, I I managed to get it out and get a book launch in the UK just no. before lockdown hit. So I was very fortunate in that sense. Are you guys still in strict lockdown? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. With um, we were in something called tier three, right? And the, the government were kind of like, oh no, it's going to all be relaxed for Christmas. It's you know, everybody's going to have a lovely Christmas, and then. They've turned up this new mutant strain of coronavirus. Oh no! Um, we find that um, Christmas has been cancelled. Uh, yeah. All international flights out of the UK are basically stopped. They're not even letting freight out at the moment. So we can like, oh shit! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. So yeah, we're we're in heavy lockdown here at the moment. Yeah, and you know, there's probably like... going to be food shortages and riots on the streets and zombies and who who knows what you know. Yeah, for, forgive my uh, phrasing, but America's a shit show right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> in, in kind of the same ways, we're in and out of, it, you know, I guess you guys call it tier three. We're like code orange or whatever, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, That's another, problem. yeah, exactly. Like the doomsday yeah. clock is getting closer mm. at night. I, I console myself by watching old uh, Cold War thermonuclear horror movies, you know? I love it. Like what? Threads is a really good one. Hmm. I'm not familiar. It's a, it's a British made uh, film about basically it's all set in Sheffield, which is this big city in the north of England. And it's it starts off with uh, Russians in Afghanistan and, and America flexing its muscles and then basically thermonuclear right. destruction rains down on, on, on the city. And then, you know, it, it, it goes about 30 years in the future. You know, it probably... It, you know, we don't just get nuclear holocaust, we get you know, martial law, people being shot for looting, people being moved across into each other's houses, mutations, you know, nuclear winter, collapse of civilization, you know. Right. That's great if, if you want to really depress <laughs> yourself. You know? Well, if, yeah, if you I, want to feel better you know, about I was, now. I was brought up in the Cold War. Right. You know, I, 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 I lived under the, the, you know, this thing they had called the four-minute warning. Right, the paranoia. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and it was, you know, literally at any moment you know the, the the four minute warning would go off and then we've got four minutes four minutes to do something fun really quickly you know right well like as you said too about you know punk rock during that time was an answer to thatcher and reagan mm. you know it makes sense it's a it's a, a a freeing kind of vehicle against you know the oppressive paranoia i'm sure that was rampant mm. during that time yeah <laughs> But again, this you know, I think chaos magic is has got many different elements in it. Um, the way I've started to think about it is, it's it's less of a unified thing. It's not really a tradition in the way that people tend to frame traditions. I mean, right. no tradition it is, but that's another matter. But you know, and it's it's very much depends on the individual perspective of of some guy or woman who's written a book. Right. You know, you, you read Pete Carroll <laughs> stuff and it's all very kind of like hum -pa, hum -pa. it's very like Pete, you know, I, I know Pete Carroll, so I, I, I'm sure, yeah. Stuff. I just hear Pete talking, you know, and I, I, he's kind of like very, you know, science. And, right. Uh, yes. You know, almost very reductionist. And, and I'm kind of like, hey, you know, let's let's play around and have a bit of fun, you know, and I actually don't care whether it works or not. You know, people say, oh, well, I do it because it works. And so, well, yeah, but anything can work you know anything could be felt to work you know this whole thing about pragmatism and magic i think is a huge blind because anything can work right you know, all, yeah. you, 
you know, they said the big thing about occultists that I find amazing is that, you know, we can criticize each other's practices. It's like, oh, that's never going to work. That's a lot of bollocks. Oh, God. Yeah. People sticking crystals in their fatty. (laughs) What's that that all about? You know, (laughs) but it obviously works for those people. You know, or else presumably they wouldn't do it. Or at least they wouldn't try and sell it to other people. I I must tell you this. I had this this anecdote. Um, I went to this meeting. It was this guy who was like a new age teacher. And uh, he was he was saying, oh, I'm going to tell you, do this experience and allow you to contact your past lives. And I was going, I'm, I mean, I'm already hugely skeptical about that at this point. Mm. And I go, oh, yeah. So he gets us to pair off and we've got to look into each other's eyes. And one says yin and the other says yang for about 10 minutes. And that's it. And I'm going, and that's going to uncover past lives. Yeah, right. You know, so I mean, this last hours we, we just went bing and, bing and bong you know and uh afterwards we all had to share our experiences and there was all these people coming out with these amazing past life experiences and and i of course said well no it didn't do anything for me but it was, right. oh, i think you'll find it was working subconsciously i said no i think you'll find it wasn't working at all but you know i saw i thought about this afterwards and i thought okay i find that you know, this whole idea that looking into a partner's eyes for 10 minutes and saying yin and yang can recover past life experience. Really nonsense, you know. But on the other hand, most of the people there have never had that kind of experience, you know. Right. They've never tried anything like that. So who am I to be critical that it's, you know, their exposure to something outside their, their normal repertoire of behaviour has, has given them some kind of experience. It might not be a, authentic past life but really who am i to be critical and yeah I think a lot of magic is like that you know so yeah there's a gatekeeping aspect for sure i think with yeah. a lot of yeah and like i, I always but ask just love people to criticize are... each other right it? yeah i think that's that, also that, that was chaos magic people in america they're talking bollocks you know? this is the proper chaos magic you know oh yeah it's been a headache for me for sure uh <laughs> for many years but, uh, you know, there's also this artistic element, too, of the, you know, self-critical nature um, and the skepticism. And, you know, when it comes to, like, the deep woo that I think that even in the most pragmatic, you know, senses of magic, people feel like, who are we to bemoan experiential, you know, elements from other people, you know? So, oh, do, yeah, let's go. do you think that... Um, is, are, are there any sources of, you know, this kind of woo, this, this you know, uh, this vein of experience that you are absolutely skeptic of, like, just wholeheartedly? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, we, we could, we, yeah, crystals. Right, we could make a list. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to make crystals, reincarnation, right. energy, will, you know, I could go on all day, but I mean, why bother? Right. You know, the, the, those, oh, the astral plane. I've no, I, no, no. The astral plane is a colonial artifact uh, hoisted upon us by 19th century theosophists who, who wanted to use it to colonize the imagination. Got a whole rant about that. Oh, wow. Um, but, you know. So they're like planting in, bombs and generations of thought. Well, you know, you, you look at you, you look at early theosophical writings about the astral plane, and the, 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 it's, it's like, you know, they're actually very like 19th century Royal Geographical Society manuals of darkest Africa, you know, uh, we'll go out and we'll, you know, but these are the inhabitants of the astral plane, you know, voodoo practitioners, and dark black magic. It's, you know, it's very dramatic stuff, but you know, it somehow becomes factual. So I think in a very early edition of, of Prime Chaos, I tried to throw out this idea of the astral plane right. and, and but virtual magic instead didn't go down very well and I think it didn't make it into later editions but yeah I'm very skeptical about a lot of magical stuff but that's that's me you know yeah I enjoy being skeptical I I'm very I, I, yeah. I have done you know I've done stuff I've done work with crystals but right only once yeah. or twice and only on, under duress you know right you seem curious you know like as as am I you know I, I'll always listen to the experiences of people with that sort of that shade of that woo, right? Yeah. Uh, who am I to say they're not having that experience? Yeah, even you know? though they think it's bollocks. Right, <laughs> even though I think it's no. bollocks. Yeah. You, can, you can have both <laughs> views, you know. You can say, well, that's not for me, you know. 
it's, it's kind of interesting because I had this a, a bit of this kind of like tension with because I, I spent about 10 years doing a very kind of like um, Western oriented Tantra. Um, and I, you know, I, I do something a bit different nowadays. Uh, but I kind of like look back at that first 10 years and just, well, was that all bollocks? No, it wasn't because it kept me interested. It kept me right. on the path, if you like. Um, it's not what I would do now, but I'm glad I did it, you know. Now I know that some of those rituals are completely made up and, and odd from a traditional point of view, but um, you know, it was it was fun. I enjoyed it. You know, I'm yeah. not going to invalidate and say, "Oh, that was all wrong." You know, I'm not it, that invalidates it. And I think uh, you can do a lot of that with magic. You could look back at your early stuff. I mean, I've got magical diaries from 30 years ago, and I read them nowadays, and I just go, "Jesus Christ, what <laughs> what a tit!" You know, I was really <laughs> up my own ass with you know, being pompous and, and all the rest of it, you know. Yeah. I had this habit of, instead of writing people's names, I'd write them in some kind of, like, magical script, and I've, now I have no idea who those people are. Uh. <laughs> so all the way through this one diary, it's about five years, I keep referring to this person under this magical script, and I have no idea who that is, you know. I, I love that. Yeah, it's kind of lost forever. <laughs> you know, it's gone, you know. Yeah. Those diaries will be burnt on the day I die, I think. Who knows? You may have like a, uh, you know, the, it'll it'll come back to you in some, you know, experience. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe <laughs> not. Hope not. Your pseudonomicon, right? Mm -hmm. Your like personal practice and ethos of a different folklore. How is that not, you know, as strong as these traditions? Tra tradition is always an interesting phrase because you you know there's this you can be on on different sides of it simultaneously so you can be you could be traditional and that's good because you're following it following the, the the approved method of doing something and you can be you can be you can accuse somebody of being traditional because of the stuff you get you know it just has no imagination and creativity they just blah 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 follow the rules right. I, I've, I've been doing the same Ganesha Puja for about 30 years wow <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty, I mean, yeah, we add bits in occasionally, but it's pretty much the same ritual. Um, and it's just because I like it, you know? Sure. I, I, yeah. like the, I like the structure. It's not about, for me, it's not about orthopraxy. There, there are strong orthopractic elements in Tantra, but for me, it's not about orthopraxy. It's, it's about enjoyment, you know? How has it felt now that, you know, this kind of uh, extensu extenuation of, you know, your practice with Heinz Varieties is now out into the world. Are you, are you finding a lot of people that maybe have taken condensed, you know, too seriously and are surprised? I don't know, because I've not had really had that kind of feedback. I mean, there was these two guys who did a podcast a few years ago on condensed chaos, and I listened to it and I just thought, wow, your ideas on what's important in that book are not my ideas it's it oh, was, wow. it was really kind of like strange because i thought no you're taking stuff really seriously that i only meant as a joke mm -hmm. you know <laughs> yeah. uh, how does that I, feel I, I, <laughs> um it feels kind of weird yeah. i mean just you, you know you we were talking about the pseudonomicon earlier there's this thing in the front this like disclaimer right. like, i forget where it is but it's really it's really you know pompous and uh, that was a joke and it's amazing how many people have just taken that really seriously. Like, oh, yes. No, I was joking, actually. Mm. Um, and I think and because humor is very subjective, um, it's often, you know, it's often difficult for it to come across, for it to cross the, if you like, probably the northern UK to, you know, American boundary. Sure. I often, yeah. you know, I often, I often say things as jokes and people take them really seriously, but then I often like to mess people's heads up anyway you know <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's, that's a, a big part of chaos a, a big yeah that whole trickster thing i think is overdone but i think there's a big element of of in chaos magic certainly in in early chaos magic of just yeah let's fuck people's heads up a bit you know if we can get away with it. in a nice way you know in a lovely right. way yeah, there were always testaments know. too from you as you know as a practitioner of it these were always like not so much how to's, but hey, this is mm. what I did, and this is what you know yeah. affected. Me. I mean, the, the way you think about chaos, condensed chaos, is I wrote it really quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I heard from my agent that I'd got a contract with uh 
new falcon as it was then and this was about i think may or something and he said oh they'd like a manuscript by september wow and i was, I was kind of like oh and, and how much do they want you know in terms of mm -hmm. words and she said, oh, about sixty thousand words should do it and i was kind of like, shit you know so i basically just wrote it really fast and fortunately I had, I had, by that point i'd had about 10 15 years of writing other stuff so i just basically you know threw lots of stuff into it and i was i was doing a um I think I was running a course on on practical magic uh, in London at the time, and so that went into it. And you know, loads of things just got shoehorned into it really fast. Yeah. Um, so in a way, I'm I'm surprised that it's 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 lasted. You know, it's it's still I mean, it still outsells everything else. Yeah, it's it's great. It's else because in recent one, it's kind of like oh, that sold a couple of hundred, that sold a couple of hundred, that sold not very much at all. Shit. Condensed chaos. So I sold about a thousand copies last year. You know. Oh yeah, Which I, I think have... it's not bad for a book that was written in '95. You know. Right. Yeah, I have friends that you know that have a passing familiarity with magic and ca mm. condensed chaos is on their bookshelves. Mm. Like, what's your relationship with it now? Like after all these years. Um. There, there was a time um when i was actually thinking of not having it really uh kept in print really I, I just got so sick of people going ah phil hein he's a cast magician because i was thinking actually no um there's more to me than that you know of course and, and i got into this real adversarial relationship with my own cast magic writing i just wanted to forget the whole thing uh and some very good friends said to me look this is a really good book you know um you should Get the publishers to reprint it you know it's still got value um because i was actually getting into this real kind of um as i say negative right. relationship Look with my own early writing you know which i think is, is okay um and now that i'm kind of like uh not employed by a major corporation anymore it's it's actually quite valuable to have it out there making me money so nice <laughs> and, and I, I sort of read it every couple of years or so, or, and just think, oh, okay, yeah, that bit's okay, that bit's a bit dreadful, and that bit's okay, you know. So, yeah, yeah. I've got back into a sort of um, more equinamous, equipoisal relationship with my own early chaos writings. You know, one of the big things when I was talking to friends about, you know, talking to you, as someone that's put out many musical albums, I don't want to talk about the one from 2004 and not the yeah. ones after. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was definitely on my mind because, you know, and you've been so upfront and, you know, kind of wonderful about your experience with it. And it's just, it's um, affirming to kind yeah. of see that same artistry and that like self-critical nature and that weird relationship you have things with you know that you put out into the world so many years later yeah. well I, I think it's important to to be self-critical yeah uh, or, or to have people around you who are willing to be very critical i mean my partner <laughs> Marie is extremely critical oh i've got one of those my writing which is great you know because <laughs> nobody else will be people will, oh that's really nice I should go, no, that's really shit. Nobody wants to hear about that stuff in a lecture. It's boring. That should be in a piece of writing when people can engage with it at the leisure, but nobody wants to hear about that in a lecture. I have and the same relationship. Right, you know? <laughs> yeah. She's usually quite right. So uh, she gets to read everything I, I write. Yeah. Uh, my partner is is the same. Like if, if she can't compute it, she'll be the first one to say, and she's kind of my outlet to writing for the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to say, and this is pre-internet, obviously, you know, if somebody writes you a shitty letter, you should put them on your Christmas card list about something you've written, because, you know, that means they've taken the trouble to be so incensed by what you've written that they've actually, you know, wrote to your carrier or publisher or your editor a, a, a stroppy letter telling you what they think. Right. And, so, and that kind of critique is rare, because most people just go, oh, yeah, it's very nice, or no, this is crap, throw it away. But, you know, if somebody's actually moved strongly enough to um address you directly that's that's a good thing of course you can have too much of that nowadays with right. email and social media being so making things so immediate that it's really easy to go ah, it's just rubbish yeah. you know, go away shut up amazon reviews yeah two stars <laughs> oh, i never read them i never read them. <laughs> oh i'm sure they're 
I'm sure you'd be surprised uh, because I'm I'm sure they're phenomenal for for your books. No, I'm sure I'm sure there's some really crap ones, you know. Yeah, of course. There well, that, that's that's part of the course, you know. You, yeah. you you're involved in the creative industry, whether it be writing or music or whatever. You stick your head up above parapet. People are going to have you go. At you. That's just life, you know. Yeah, you know, there's something you said about them being so incensed to take the time and the passion, to, you know, to yeah. draft something against it kind of makes me think about hexing you know mm. this idea of hexing in a way where it's like I'm, I'm i'm not really worried about the result of someone hexing me i'm more worried about the psychological implications that they felt moved mm. enough to do it that, that's that's <laughs> a really interesting point because that's always you know when people bring up that very tricky subject of right yes cursing people are, I've, I've been cursed you know i said well who why would somebody bother cursing you you know right what yeah. what is it about you that somebody would go to all that trouble to curse you you know because i think 99 percent of cursing is is either it's in your own head yeah you know it can be dismissed once you work through a very simple set of principles like have you been eating enough have you been drinking enough water mm -hmm. have you been maybe taking too many drugs you know once those all those things are eliminated you might then you can start thinking about cursing but the other thing of course is is people like to think they're being cursed they're important enough right you know, for those nasty black magicians down the road <laughs> to, to be sticking pins in a doll or whatever I, I was at a party many years ago and there was this guy going on about being cursed by Satanists. I, and I'm sure these these Satanists were in his own head, and he was going on about how he was, you know, having these big astral battles and stuff with them and all that shit. Um, and he turned around to me and he said, and, "And what happened? What do you? How do you do cope with this stuff?" I said, "I just send Tracy round, and there's this huge woman all in black leather with big studded belt and like." fingerless study gloves and I, I send Tracy around and she breaks their fingers and she's like <laughs> wow <laughs> big lesbian friend of mine who was really butch you know short cropped hair studs yeah. leather and he was kind of like oh, you know um and I, I I remember many years ago um this guy really fucked me off and I was gonna curse him and I must have known about a couple of you know dozen you know, fairly effective ways of cursing somebody by that point. You know? Sure. I've yeah. Had my, I mean, the very first magic I ever did was to curse somebody. So, you know, I, you know I'm not a tyro when it comes to that sort of thing. <laughs> no, this guy needed something special. I just didn't want to pull off, like, I'll do an off the shelf thing. I thought, I knew, really need to pull the stops out on this and really, you know, really kick him in the pants, you know death's too good for him kind of thing why well, let him off early with reincarnation to a house no, no and i spent literally an entire night thinking of really really evil ways to curse this guy <laughs> and then in the morning i realized i just you know i just wasn't angry anymore i kind right. of like instead of pushing all those naughty thoughts aside about cursing because it's unethical and all that stuff which yeah of course it is um, I, I, I allowed myself to get really enraged and, and be in yourself. Some yeah. quite, quite some quite creative ways. Um, that you know, that's that story in, in Heinz Varieties, right? The, the guy, and it's got this thing called a Bertio trap in it. I think that came out of that that evening of just having total evil thoughts about this, about this dude. Um, but I'd, I'd actually blown out my anger, you're right. And we, you know, and in the end, I didn't bother curse him because I just thought, actually, he's not worth my time. That's funny. Yeah, so, like, just the meditative effort of, you know, like, the intention, you know, and the anger, you just kind of, it allowed itself to just die off. Yeah, by, instead by, by of, going, are you happy you didn't act on it? it? No. Right. Um, well, I'm sure so. you are now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, it just wasn't worth the time, you know? Yeah, and I find um, that yeah, about most. Yeah, it would have been hexing. much easier just to just to ring up one, my an old mate of mine who was an ex ex you know army guy and just say hey, you know, rough him up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, post a piece of shit through his door, something like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is obviously all I have to call. Him. I would not ever advocate ever doing anything like that. I mean, of course. The, the thing is, I. The, the Wiccans I, I knocked around with were very into the idea of almost like community cursing. So if some, somebody does something wrong in the community, then 
they have this idea of, yeah, you know, you do curse them because we're not, we, we don't want that rapist going around harassing women. Right. Yeah. He has to be found. He has to be, you know, stopped from raping any more women. So they had this very kind of like, I guess, pragmatic approach to, to ethical issues like that. And it's sure. kind of like, if you can do something to stop somebody being bad, then you do it, you know, no messing. How do you feel about like the politicking of a cult and like the the covens that were you know cursing our president or whatever? W what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's great. Actually. Right. Yeah. yeah, that whole thing. Oh, it works. Is is oh, has been increasingly over the years a, a difficult area for me because they right. make all kinds of claims about oh we did this and oh we did that. You know, um, I just think that's inviting hubris. Uh, oh. But I mean, yes, Trump is out, but I mean, um, well, he's not actually out yet, of course, because he's still hanging in my nails. Um, but, and people say, oh yeah, we did that, but okay, you helped, you know? Sure. It's the best you can say. Um, I fully in, into people doing um, magic for political purposes. Um, right. Because I, I, I have very strong feelings that like, that is a good thing to do. Uh, However, having said that, I really hate my magicians talking about politics because <laughs> I just think it just sounds, particularly when they go on about all the spiritual reality behind this or that political event, and it, it just sounds awful to me. You know, it's the same feelings I have. There's this like Venn diagram of the conspiratorial world and the occult world, right? And in the middle, there's a lot of that, and it's a lot of uh, ascription of. I hate to use the term, but like it's a victimhood. Of yeah. some sort, you know, it's not like a personal responsibility. It's, and it's, 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 it's that thing of all, you know, we're the people who know what's going on kind of thing. Right. Which I, I really hate because yeah. often you're the, the last people who know what's going on. Um, so I, I don't like magicians talking about politics because, you know, usually they're not that um, aware of stuff. Sure. That's my personal experience. But I, I think, you know, ma doing magic is a political act. I love that. Yeah. There's, there's, there's no way you can es escape that, you know. Um, Especially if, yeah, if we're talking about, you know, conducting pathways to open for things to happen. When I was first getting into magic in the in the 70s and 80s, there was this huge thing about magicians and witches not being political. Um, right. I just thought that was rubbish because... You know, if, if you're serious about um, your own practice and, and having a sense of power and agency, then why why shouldn't you be, you know, using your magic to influence the world? Yeah. Whether you, of course you can or not is another matter, but at least you can make the effort and try, you know. You, you, you know, you look at, um, or it, saying that magic is not political, I think is, is nonsense. You look at most world cultures, I mean, you know, in England in the in the 18th, in the 17th century, it was illegal to cast the horoscope of the king. Right. You could be put in the slammer for casting the horoscope of a, of a member of the royal family because that implied that you were looking for to you know put your magical dukes on him, as it were. Uh -huh. So uh, magic and politics for me have always have been two things that are very closely um, together with each other. You want community. You want unity. <laughs> you know, you want people I don't to. Know about unity, but I mean, I think community is good. You know. Right. Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah. Discourse is is best. Mm. Um, yeah. But it, at the it, same time, so, you know, conversation, disagreement, right. even you know, disagreement can be really good. Um, and um, something Rodney Office got me into in in the eighties when I was I was working a lot with Rodney was this whole Vulcan thing of infinite diversity, infinite combination. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, were both, we were like huge Star Trek fans and we, we got into this whole idea of, you know, um, if, if we're serious about individual freedom, then we have to allow people to have different opinions. Right. Absolutely. To an extent, you know. Right. <laughs> um, and, and to allow different combinations to come forth out of that. And, and sometimes that means, you know, not trying to paper over the cracks and saying, yeah, we're all disagreements in, in this group, in this magical order, in this tradition. You know, we don't agree with each other. Um, their attentions, you know, we and we don't try and resolve them or, or brush them aside. We acknowledge them, you know. And, yeah, and that was a really good thing about QPC because Queer Peg and Cat because mm -hmm. 
uh, when it came down to it, you know, if you said you were queer, then they accepted you as queer. And it wasn't about your sexual orientation or who your partner or partners were. It was self-definition. So there, there, there was a, re a recognition that baked in, if you like, that, that there were, this was something that transcended path or, or sexual orientation. I and love I that. that a, really yeah. good, a really good base to work from, you know. Yeah. I mean, it all fell apart eventually, and people had huge rails and oh. don't <laughs> anymore. But you know, kind of, it was good while it lasted. Do you, yeah, and it seems like it just keeps churning. You know, the more I want uh, with my, especially you know, in 2020 during lockdown, I'm, I'm finding a lot of parasocial relationships on the internet, and there's mm -hmm. a there's a hard edge when it comes to people understanding humor or you know disagreements and you know the surprising thing that people say with me is that like you know i can put up a fight but i don't hate you afterwards mm -hmm. you know? like, like i want to keep that going but it's very hard for most people uh, especially in the cult sphere to like disagree and be happy about the disagreement yeah it's difficult i mean i you know there are still people i won't talk to now after 20 years because that business with the with the avocado right <laughs> 1992 or something, whatever it was, and I'm still not talking to them. Um, I think the because the occult occult practice touches us very deeply and yeah. very personally, and it's easy to become you know in, invested in that. Uh, and so and so it's like when groups fall out, you know. I yeah, mean, exactly. It's that there's a, I don't I know people who. Who were in groups 30 years ago and they've fallen out, they're still fighting over those same issues. I'm yeah, probably not them, actually. Um, and that's kind of fine. And I think it's sometimes good to acknowledge that. It'd be nice if we could all move on, but right. sometimes we, I think it's, it's really difficult. I mean, there's, there's people I know who I fell out with 30 years ago, and it's almost kind of like it's not actually. You know, we can't just suddenly snap into a kind of like, oh, we're all fine now with each other because there's too much unresolved stuff. And we probably have to sit down for a couple of weeks and, you know, relive some extremely painful material to get on an even keel again. Um, so at some point, um, yeah, disagreements can turn nasty. And I think that's just something you have to live with. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. I... And sometimes, you, sometimes uh, I think social media is, is good in that sense, because it allows me to contact people who I'm kind of like really wary of having a, a direct face-to-face -face encounter with, but I can kind of slowly um, rework my feelings about them by having a limited contact through social media. Yeah. I was going to ask you about your relationship with social media, especially after publishing before the advent of, you know, the internet mm -hmm. and all of that, like how that's changed maybe the publishing game or, or your outreach. I think it's it's generally been a good thing. I mean, the, in the early '90s, my first response to the internet was to get you know I started PDFing a lot of my old writings and just letting it go out there. And uh, nowadays, that would be seen as a really incisive marketing move. In fact, I'd, I'd, I've been reading some guys who. You know, there's these guys who do courses for writers, and they say and one of the things they recommend is that oh, you know, give something away for free. Right. And I just thought, yeah, I've, I've got had books that I've given away on the internet for free and then people have translated them into like Spanish and French and, and Russian. Yeah, that's you know? amazing. Uh, we, and, and occasionally I've had people say, oh, I've just trans translated your book permutations into Italian. Do you mind if I sell it? Absolutely not. You know, you can give it away <laughs> free, but right. you know, that book is, is not for sale, you know, and I've been quite specific about that. And uh, I, th I think the, the the onset of the internet, um, you know, because I, I worked in publishing a very long time. Right. I worked in, in book production, two book production companies and, and in a magazine company. And uh, I think the internet has changed the game somewhat. Um, but I've always done my own self-promotion. In, in a way, I'm very fortunate as a writer because I can like became fairly established, you know, even before the internet. Right. Um, you know, I, I I do a lot of free writing, if you like. People have said to me, oh, you could go behind a, a Patreon thing. And I just go, oh, I can't be interested. <laughs> um, because I, 
I, I think if I was doing that whole Patreon thing, I'd, I'd feel like I had to write stuff that people wanted. Rather right. Than what I, yeah. There's yeah. There's that's, an expectation. That's what I enjoy. You know, I don't want to write another. You know, how to contact your chakras because I, I just find that dull <laughs> you know, and boring. And whereas I'd, I'd be far happier writing about the history of of um, of how the idea of chakras arose in, in Western esotericism over the course of you know 50 years in the 19th century. That yeah. interests me. Writing a whole thing about well how to activate your chakras just it would bore me senseless, you know. <laughs> right. um, so I'm, I'm not. I I can't do this thing of oh let's let's find out what people want and then, <coughs> and you teach me. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I I don't have the patience for that. I've I've tried. Um, the the only time teaching somebody really worked was uh, for a very brief period of time. And what I would say to people is, look, I'll tell you what I know, what works for me, magical wise. But only on the condition that you'll get better than me at something and you'll come back and teach me. I love that. Yeah. So, you know, there, has, there, has, there has to be a, a, a reciprocal relationship. Yeah. Here. You know, uh, I'm not just telling you, you know, truths that have come down off the astral plane. I'm just, you know, sharing my ideas and, and wacky stuff with you. My hope is that you'll get better than me at something and, and come back and teach me you know and that worked a couple of times um and you know i think with everybody who gets to a certain age you, you got start thinking you say oh you know I've, I've got ideas to impart i've got you know truths i want to share with the world i'm going to become a magical teacher and i think i don't have the patience i just like talking to people you know yeah there seems to be just an an onslaught of diy magic books uh in the past few years and it seems to be, um, how do I put it, not not from people that are seasoned, but very fresh. Yeah. Uh, with a lot of things. In, in a way, that's publishing. Right. You know, because it's kind of like, well, publishers want to sell books, so they go with what's popular. Yeah. So, you know, this is why virtually every occult book written, I think, between 1974 and, and 19. 99 has to have a chapter on chakras in it because <laughs> chakras sell or crystals or tarot you know tarot right. is, is huge tarot popular. is huge right tarot now is, is yeah. amazingly popular people who work in marketing departments of police will say, will say yeah that sells and nowadays what happens with a lot of big publishers is that uh it's not so much that you write a book and then go on to them and say oh i've written this book do you want to publish it um they will actually you know shape a catalog uh, and then go out and look for for people to write that stuff, and you know there's there's been cases I know of of people who've say started writing a book on tarot, very interesting. Editors have had a look at it that no, this is not what we want. We're going to actually give this project to somebody else. Right. Yeah. What's free is, of course, is you know is is print on demand publishing, and publishing book. I mean, having just published a book um, under my own imprint very recently. It is a much easier process than it was 20 years ago. I was, you know, hugely surprised actually that it was actually a lot easier than I thought it would be. Are you talking about like the advent of like, say, Lulu or? Uh... Uh, yeah, Amazon, Lulu, yeah. um, all the million and other print on demand options. Yeah. I I think that's good. And the author has to do a certain amount of legwork. I think that's always been true, particularly in, in esoteric publishing, which is a you know, a niche area at best. But it, when I say it's a niche area, you have to remember it's a multi-billion dollar right. niche area. You know, we're, we're yeah. talking serious money here. So, um, and yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of shit that gets published. But, <laughs> you know, I think that's a good thing. Absolutely, yeah. I you know, mean... I, 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 yeah, it's just, I start, it helps I you weed out. With, yeah. with uh, David Conway's Magic and Occult Primer. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great book. You know, it was, it was one of the first practical books I, I picked up. I've been having read a lot of theosophical wibbly wobbly, which had nothing <laughs> practical at all in it, right. um, and a lot of Dennis Wheatley books. And that was the first book that actually, you know, gave me step by step instructions. And um, again, this is something I think people get really snooty about. You know, it's always kind of like, oh, you know, you've read the read the done the you know the 
I don't know, Jenny Green Teeth's Book of Practical Spells. Uh, right. No, I, I read Corny Lewis Agrippa. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. You know. yeah. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody was tweeting this morning about, you know, people not being so, being told to read Agrippa as their first book. You know, and just, I've never read Agrippa. <laughs> you know, I, I guess, you know, um, I don't really have that problem because the, the kind of books I get to read are things like the uh, Siddha Yoga's Very Matter Tantra, you know, which was written in 8th century Kerala or somewhere. Wow. You know. um, so, that, that, you know, that whole kind of question of which occult book should I start off reading? It's kind of like, well, any occult book, you know. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, and I think I've mentioned this. Might have mentioned this in in Heinz Varieties. The the only reason I got interested in all this stuff in the first place because I was looking, I was reading Man Myth and Magic and looking for pictures of nude witches in it. You know, exactly. I wanted to bring that up because I have the full collection <laughs> of Man Myth and Magic. Yeah, like and there's the those, those, those those pictures of Alexanders and, yeah, and exactly. Alexanders in, in the nip, and exactly. you know, yeah. I was kind of <laughs> sixteen in the school library reading this. Oh, looking for nude know, witches yeah looking for nude witches and that's kind of what started me off you know yeah i look yeah and if i can end up where i am <laughs> and after 40 years of being silly um having started out just on the the basis of wanting to look at pictures of nude witches um <laughs> i really don't think it actually matters what you what you start out reading you know yeah the world's at your fingertips again, you know, nude witches these days anything you know anything can maybe make, make to work yeah, you know, just just keep that mantra in mind. You know, and anything can be made to work if you're up for it. I love that. You know, do you have your finger on like kind of the pulse of you know modern occultism? Are there uh, modern writers that you find kind of rise above the rest? Yeah, I, I don't read occult books. You know, right. I, I I read occult books. You know, trans translations of, of tantric texts, or I read very uh, hard to get your head around academic. Uh, commentaries on on same or you know uh, i read a lot of ethnological material but i don't read the cult books i actually can't remember what the last cult book i read was wow yeah. I, I i read them i read i sort of skim read a lot of them for a while because i was working for uh i was working for a big online um occult web store and i was actually writing book reviews so i was kind of like reading through stuff and going, uh, yeah okay. <laughs> uh, and just writing these little potted but potted reviews of these books uh but all that stopped with lockdown right well that's that's the only contact i had with the with the actual occult milieu i don't yeah I, i'm kind of like this is why i say I, I don't really engage with chaos magic so i think the last chaos magic book i read was i read one of golden white's books okay didn't think it was that interesting but the you know, protocols great. or whatever yeah uh it was pieces of eight okay yeah i haven't, yeah. I haven't read it well, that 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 was it, you know. So no, yeah. I don't read cool books. Do you, are you like in Congress with any uh, cultists these days, or is it more of just an individual practice and you're just doing your own thing? Um, I've got friends who are cultists, so I still, you know, we have chats about this and that. Um, I'm still in the contact with uh, with some of the tantric practitioners have not been knocking around with for the past 20 odd years right uh, i know tantra has been such a major you know component uh, of your life let Almost. me wave something out to you in fact Ooh, i think i've seen this on unfolding yeah yeah well, uh this is a it's mike mcgee is a is a guy who's been is a tantric practitioner who's been translating uh, tantric texts since about the late 80s. Also a very high, highly re regarded IT journalist as well. He started oh. to register. Oh, weird. Wow. familiar with the register. Mm. Uh, but this, this is, book is a, um, a collection of his, of his translations of um, material relating to Yakshinis. Yakshinis are kind of like um, Indian forest spirits. Right. Um, often, often related to trees. And what like you get, in, it, kind of like fairies, yeah, I guess. Fairy, fairy folk with teeth because they're kind of jealous. But <laughs> uh, what Mike has done is he's gone through a lot of um, tantric material, looking looking at the, you know, the methods by which these these fierce, often jealous female spirits can be uh, propitiated or approached or you know, asked for for wealth or some other operant desire. 
uh, and he's kind of summarised these texts. So it's it's kind of, it's a very specialised work, and a lot of it is in uh, we've we've included the original Sanskrit. Oh wow! This this I I basically typeset this and um, design the cover and so forth. And, oh, very and, cool. Oh. Um, we, we, Do you think we it's a it's a good introductory uh, text for? Um, no, not really. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's not. A, it's not an idiot's guide to <laughs> to something that by by any means. You, you, it is fairly specialized. You you know sure. uh, to to make use of it, you you'd have to have a general familiarity with 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 Indian magic. But Do you have a recommendation people, for uh, not an idiot's guide, but you know a good uh, kind of introduction to? Um, oh yeah, I, did, I would say without much hesitation, probably the best introduction to Tantra written nowadays is Christopher Wallace's Tantra Illuminated. Okay. Um, it's 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 now. Having said that, it, it mainly focuses on on the non-dual uh, tantric traditions, but you know, getting your head around that stuff would be a big big help. So he, he doesn't look at the post classical tantric tradition. He doesn't look at the. Uh, he leaves a lot of stuff out, but the stuff he does talk about is really really good. Um, he's he's a very good writer for for taking very um, very let's say difficult tantric ideas and, and making them comprehensible to a Western audience. Okay. He's, a, he's kind of a scholar practitioner. So um, yeah, Christopher Wallace's book, Tantra Illuminated, check it out. It's a really good introduction to, to tantric thought. It's not a practice book. Right. But before you can practice, you need to have, get your handle about what those people are saying. Um, Absolutely. I think, I think it's, it's a great book for that. I wish, I wish I, I wish you'd written it 20 years ago. It would have saved me a lot of, a lot of trouble, you know? <laughs> so like because we, my, my, my tantric mentor did say to me he said you realize it's going to take you 10 years to start to, before you'll get your head around this properly mm -hmm. um well he was quite right you know it had taken me a very long time to start, even start thinking i was making progress you know <laughs> after 10 years yeah yeah oh it's nothing is it really oh right yeah um you know your work with unfolding you get to my age, Maddie, i know i'm 60 just just half just half oh christ <laughs> i feel even older now you know there's there's so many questions that flood my mind of like mm -hmm. you know i ha how have you been dealing with quarantine like have you been working on something is it coming out like uh okay what's... well i mean it's it's been really weird because it's pretty much my practice at the moment is going for a walk every day i love it you know, uh, we're very fortunate here in London. There's there's lots of green spaces within walking distance. So, what I found I will do is is regardless of the weather, I will go out into a green space and spend at least half an hour, you know, in as secluded place as I can, just doing a meditation. Yeah, that's great. And and that's you know, that's the basic of my practice really. And and just um, it, it's very I think. Something I'm saying to my friends continually is, look, this is not a normal situation. Um, you can't judge your behavior and productivity, particularly by normal standards. Yeah, you know? I appreciate hearing give, that. <laughs> give, give yourself some slack, yeah. you know, um, because things are not normal. Uh, this is affecting us in all kinds of weird ways that we don't always acknowledge. Uh, if, if if you have too high a kind of like an expectation of what you should be doing versus what you actually can do, you're going to cause yourself grief. And that's right. something else that, that came out of my OT practice because I, I did a stint working with people who were basically had terminal illnesses. You know, um, like palliative. And, sorry, palliative. Like, um... well, we, we we had to, we had to give them things to do, hmm. occupy them. But and make sure that the things we gave them to do were challenging, but not so challenging that it actually reminded them that their skills were deteriorating. Right. You know, so we had to keep people interested, but not make them depressed because they, they they'd realise that they can't do the things they used to be able to do anymore. Which you know takes a, a certain amount of fine judgment. I I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed working with people who are dying. You know, not, yeah. not a lot of OTs don't because 
the whole old te ethos is about getting people better you know getting them rehabilitated but i really enjoyed working with people who are popping their clogs any minute <laughs> so that's um, a hard truth you know yeah so uh what am i working on well we've just brought out yakshini magic so i'm probably mm -hmm. going to be tweeting about that um there's, there's this uh, series of booklets I wrote in the mid 80s that's now known as the Shamanic Trilogy. Um, there, it's all over the web, basically. What I've been thinking is um, reprinting that, probably as a softback, because I don't think it deserves the, the limited edition hardback treatment. I just <laughs> find that so weird. But redoing it with, with, again, that kind of contextual approach that I used in Heinz Varieties. Yeah. Uh, trying to explain how how this how these various ideas emerged, you know what I was doing magically at the time. I've also got various bits and pieces that I wrote roughly around the same time, which were going to go in in further books that never actually made it out past the door, as it were. So I'm I'm thinking of doing that as a kind of like um, maybe with a couple of interviews with me talking to other other you know people into the similar kind of practice, the sort of urban shamanic practice thing uh let's not dwell too much on that word shamanism i know i know people would get really culturally appropriate yeah yeah uh, loaded yeah no nah, it's a loaded term and we have to recognize that but you know nobody yeah. was talking about that stuff in 1986 so of course you know live with it um so i'm thinking i'm thinking of doing that um and that's in, involved a lot of excavation of really early magical records and trying to find out if if the stuff that you know what I actually thought about it as opposed to the what we actually did. So that's one project. Um, I'm doing a I've been doing a series of lectures for Treadwell's bookshop. They've got this uh, thing they call subscriber only lectures. The idea is you pay them some money each month, and you can have a you can go into I like, uh, they've got like a, a library of of lectures that are only available to subscribers, and I've done three so far. Very cool. Um, so pre-recorded, not like Zoom. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. they are. They're, 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 but they're pre-recorded audio with slides on top of me just talking about. So awesome. I've done three dealing with the history of Tantra. Um, I've, it's a three-part series. Um, I've done one on the Cannibal Club, which was this um, weird 19th century um, drinking club of anthropologists who wrote pornography. Very <laughs> strange people. <laughs> um and i'm gonna do one on, on the origins of the left hand path very that's, cool that's one of my next projects um <clears throat> aside from that uh well i'm working on another book with mike which i'm not sure we're kind of still we're about I'm about halfway through typesetting at the moment hopefully we'll be able to get that out maybe towards the middle of next year if we're lucky oh uh, that's going to be a, a, a collection of carly tantras Tantra is related to the goddess Kali, mm -hmm. subject quite dear to me. Um, aside from that, I don't know. And just frequent okay. posting on infolding.org. Well, not as frequent. I think I would like to do more posting, actually. But yeah, I, it's it's lovely. It's a know, good resource. I, 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 I used to be, when I was working for a, a major publisher, I managed to manage four a month, and now I'm down to like one or two if I'm lucky. So right. I, I think I'd like to I'd like to do more posting on it and folding because there's there's loads of things that I started and and thought oh yeah I'll I'll get back to this in a few months time and actually it turns out to be five years since I did the last right. post and I, and I I keep looking at this stuff and I really must get back to talking about that court case because I never actually finished what I wanted to say about that you know yeah there was a, a great series you did about you know yogis and gurus. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. That was, yeah. that was again just an occasional thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just and it, mm. I know it was sequential, so there was parts to it, mm. but I, I didn't realize. Yeah, it was probably stuttered. You know, yeah. when you got yeah. back to it, I, I love that about you know that kind blogging. of writing. Re, yeah. re, blogging really fits for me because I I have an idea and I write it down and I'll uh, you know either it'll stay with me and I'll get a whole bunch of posts out really quickly, or my interests will wander. Right. This, this is my big problem. My interest wanders all over the place. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it takes years to get back. Um, but I, I am thinking of doing a, uh, a book called Yogi's Behaving Badly. I love and, it. And this will be a lot of my work that I've done on, um, say, like yoga and magic in the 19th mm -hmm. century. 
uh, events in, in Indian history where we've got yogis really behaving in quite out of order ways that we don't expect, you know, like armed yogis taking over a state in, in the early 19th century. You know, I see a lot of subscription to problematic guru behavior. The way I think of it is like this. Uh, there are teachers who abuse their students in, in various ways, yeah. but does it in, invalidate the entire teaching profession? Should we, no. you know, because there's one or two teachers out there who, who abuse their positions, should we therefore get rid of all teachers? Right, it's not an absolute no. now. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing with gurus, you know? There are good gurus. There's the, there are dodgy gurus, but there are good ones. Yeah. Um, you know, what one of my Indian friends said to me is, well, you know, the, the, the good ones tend not to advertise. Right, yeah. And, and you know, the, there is precedent for this in, in, the, in the learned text. There's a... There's a um, a yogic text called the it's called the the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, and it, it's got this argument about magical powers because I, I did this whole lot of research on on yoga and magical powers, which yeah. seems to have got slipped by people's attention I think to some degree, but in the in the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra it's got this whole passage about it's got a rationale for why you shouldn't display your yogic supernatural powers in public. Or it's because it's, it's not because it's it's you know it'll get you caught up in ego or samsara or it'll stop you being spiritual and line. It's nothing to do with that. It's basically said, look, if you've got magical powers, just show them off to people in private. You know, don't show them to a big bunch of people because they'll all flock around you. They'll all become your students. You'll have so you'll spend so much time dealing with all their shit. You won't have enough time for your own practice. Yeah. So, don't do it in public, you know. And Be thought, intentional and personal with it. Yeah. You know, just just show them off to people when who won't make a big fuss about it, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you if you make a big fuss about having magical powers, you'll just attract loads of idiots who'll who'll take up all your time and you won't have any time for your own practice. So actually that's really sensible, you know. Yeah, that, that yeah, that makes perfect sense. It really does. That's it's it's funny too, with the advent, like we were talking about earlier, you know, the uh, the a culture, quote unquote, you know, with the internet and these websites, you know, I don't want to name names. But it's it's kind of like, you know, pe people who write blurbs on the back of occult books and say, oh, so-and-so uh, -so is a member of the, the Grand Order of Lunatics, you know? Right. <laughs> I, I, it always just seems to be a bit camp. Yeah. Know? Yeah, uh, why say that? Phil, yeah. Phil Hines is initiated wazoo of, of the Grand Order of fuckwits, you know? Like, <laughs> who, who cares, you know? Yeah. Okay. You have to. I know you have to do that sort of thing. I I, I got into this. I got into a bit of that with with Falcon because they wanted to put some blurb on the back of the book, and I'm going. No, I'm not having that. I think they wanted to say something about all oh, Phil Hine chaos magicians. I, well, look, the the whole point about writing the book was to say I'm not a chaos magician. Not just a chaos magician. Yeah. Not just a yeah. chaos magician. Oh, that was just a phase I went through actually. You know. Uh. So please don't describe me as a chaos magician. And they were kind of like, okay, fine, no problem. You know, some people are really good at that self promotion stuff, and I'm not really. Yeah. I think. I mean, some there's some people out there who are really adept at it, and I'm just like, uh, can't be asked. <laughs> I think I maybe should be more adept at it, and that way I'd probably have some more more money than I have now at the moment. But yeah, how is uh, you know, just to kind of wrap up this wonderful conversation, I just want to ask, like, what's your relationship with your lineage now of your work? You know, sorry, your relationship uh, with the lineage of your work, and because you're obviously like, what, what do you, you mean the lineage of my work? So uh, like. Tantra is, I think, it'd be safe to say, is your like major focus. It's my major focus at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so like your relationship to being pigeonholed, I think, as a oh, know, chaos okay. Magician. Well, yeah, it, it kind of annoys me sometimes, right. but then I think, <laughs> well, well, you know, maybe the best way to counter that is to actually get some material out there that mm -hmm. isn't chaos magic. So I, th I think that's something I need to work on. Seems like you've been doing it. Yeah, but I obviously need to do more of it. Right. So just so people say, oh, okay, I mean, you know, I don't know, maybe I should write a book on Wicca. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. It would. Tra traditional Northern English Wicca. <laughs> oh, maybe not, actually. I don't think I'm even that unusual. I think you know, most of the people I know, probably of my generation, have gone through uh, multiple tra trajectories. Right. And I think that's normal. I mean, I... You know, um, you mentioned something in your original question left about belief shifting. 
Yes. I think. Yes. And, and I, I always think of this this guy we knew at, uh, when I was in uh, York studying occupational therapy, and he tried this belief shifting exercise, and he became born again Christian, and he's still a born again Christian as far as I know. Okay. But he's a lot happier, you know. Yeah. Oh, 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 you know, he doesn't take drugs anymore. He doesn't drink anymore. His problems with women have disappeared because I, I don't think he has anything to do with women. Full stop. And he just seems a lot happier being a born again Christian. You know. Is there a want for you uh, with your work in tantra, especially like writing about it? Is there a want for it to become a bit more recognized or, or practiced, or um, is there any intent like that? I, I don't know that there is because yeah. I mean there's. You know, now that we're seeing a much more, um, now that there's more good translations appearing and some really good um, academic work being produced, which is actually really access accessible to a non-specialist audience. I don't know. I mean, I, it's something I have, a, I think for the past 15 years, I've toyed with the idea of doing a book on Tantra and I thought, nah, maybe not. So it's, it's still a kind of maybe, maybe not thing. I don't know. I might, yeah. I might not. Well, it seems like Tantra well, became a big belief like... shift for you, right? It is, but I, that doesn't necessarily mean that I want to write a book about it. Right, yeah. But this, I mean, this this was actually a problem I started to find that um, in the early 90s when I was, I was living in London, in somewhat not dissimilar circumstances that I find myself now in that I didn't have a steady income, um, I was doing loads and loads of magical workshops. I mean, a lot, you know, one-offs, week-long things. I was, you know, doing workshops on sigils, on servitors, on on performance magic, this, that, and the other, anything I could do. And I suddenly realised that I was trying out magical techniques, not because I was interested in for them for, for my own, if you like, development, but uh, because I thought they'd make good workshops. <laughs> and, I, and I, that was a real kind of like kick in the zip. I thought, like, oh shit, you know, I'm just turning into a fucking workshop person. And I got real, I, and that kind of stopped me doing workshops. And I haven't really done any workshops since. I think the last one I did was in, I think, 99 or something like that. Um, and now I find I'm actually going to other people's workshops to relearn how to do workshops. It's fine to do a workshop because you've practiced something for a long time. But I mean, to, to, to take up a technique and, and try it. It just like I just became one of those people who, who go on a six month course or three month course and, the, and then become a teacher themselves. Wrote a book about it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a book about it. That's terrible, you know. I didn't want to be that sort of person. Yeah. Um, I, I think I would like to do more. I would like to dip my hand now that I'm getting to grips with the, the podcasty world. I think I would like to do some online workshops, but I'll probably have to go actually go to some to see how it's done. Um, yeah, do you um, think it seems kind of like in Congress with, you know, chaos magic is that people, you know, even I know for me, like uh, learning music or whatever was, you know, I just wanted to write music. So I, I mm. learned as I went, like, I'm not going to publish a book about, you know, <laughs> magic or songwriting. Yeah. I'm not going to publish a book about songwriting, uh, mm. not because I don't think that you know, I write songs or whatever. It's just that I don't think I'm an authority on it. Do you think there's like too many people thinking they're authorities on this? I don't know, really. Cause... Yeah. Oh, that's right. You don't, yeah, you're not reading any occult stuff. <laughs> I don't, I don't no, <laughs> I, think, I think it's very easy to trick yourself into believing that you're an authority. Right. I, mean, I, I don't think of myself as an authority on Tantra. I just, or in fact, I don't think of myself as an authority on magic. I'm just somebody who's, you know, maybe got a big mouth. <laughs> uh, and done lot and done some stuff and wanted to share it with people. Right. Uh, that's that's yeah. how I think of it. It's just a very interesting question, actually. Is what makes a, a text authoritative? You know. Right. You know, yeah. Why do we take that text seriously? And why do we not take that text seriously? That that's a really hard question, actually. I think the collective conscious of you know practicing a work that makes it higher than another is, and that I don't know if that's necessarily true. I don't think it's true at all. Yeah, you know, I think I think there's various. I just there's, there's various. I think there's a. It's a very complex um, question that I wouldn't want to speculate about, really. But I, mean, you know, why is it that I don't know? Well, text A is preferred to text B. Um, yeah. Is it a historical thing? Um, I, I what people often say to me when when they read my work is that. 
they felt it, it they feel it resonates with them yeah what they are what off, i often get is people say oh i could have written that <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay then that's but actually a not, great compliment it is but um and i find that that, that you know that's what resonates it, it it feels natural um because people who like my work might not like it for the same reasons you know or it, you know it's it, it doesn't gel with it. I, I think this is real, this is a real interesting thing about magic that for me, which I think I tried to touch on when I was talking about fiction, is that yeah, you know, you ha there has to be an emotional connection, but and that is that emotional connection, with, whether it be with a piece of fiction or a film or a song or a supposedly you know magical textbook, there has to be an emotional resonance. Yeah, and, and that I think is really important, and I think we don't often acknowledge that, you know. Um, you know, so pe people who want their magic to be very dry and kind of like um, almost like a technical manual can can read Pete Carroll. If they want right. it all kind of like you know medieval woo woo, they can I don't know read Agrippa or somebody. See, I've no idea who Agrippa is, or, or <laughs> I've got a vague idea, obviously, but I've never actually right. read him. So. Yeah. Um, you know, and different styles of writing, different. Approach to different people. Yeah, I think is 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 the important thing. Um, once people start going on about energies and aggregates, I just lose interest. Yeah, <laughs> I got you I off think, guard with that I, earlier. I think I, th I think the explanation should be you know let's get the prosaic explanation sorted out before we go off into into real. Woo, yeah, you know. let's get real. Well, again, woo. that's that's just me, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and that you know that's something I've always really appreciated about your work is you know the kind of i hate to use the like the phrase down to earth but there is something very earthly about it and i get why people you know a compliment to you was hey i could have written this because i read some of your work i giggle to myself you know it, or it's just like yeah you know that's, an that's the reaction i'm hoping for yeah that is, you know I, I when i do lectures i'll often fix fix my gaze on one person in the audience and try my best to make them laugh <laughs> i love it yeah, is no. that, that, that seems like a great public speaking technique. You see somebody frowning, I just say, okay, going to make you laugh before the end of it. If it kills me, you know. The lasting impression I have from all your work, obviously, there's axioms of like, you know, uh, don't look for mentors like teachers, you know, look for friends. Or there's, you know, mm. quotes like, you know, uh, don't take it too seriously. Like these things last within me about my own practice well, you know the, the reason i'm writing that is because of course i spent a very long time taking it very seriously right you had you um, had to you figure know, it I, out I, yeah. I i was that person who, who bored other people stupid at parties by just <laughs> oh, don't tell him he's, he's just into the occult and he talks bollocks you know i i was that person you know yeah droning away ah, 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 ah. <laughs> why is it you don't have any friends why is it women you have problems picking up people because you just yeah. talk about the occult all the time oh yeah so yeah, I was that boring guy. I was that obsessed person. You know, I did think I was a magus. You know, and, I, and I, those are just things that you have to work through. Phil, thank you so much for giving me your time. It has been an absolute pleasure. It's been my pleasure too. I, I love <laughs> this is so much away. fun. Uh, thank um, you for starting my morning laughing. Oh, my pleasure too. And uh, have a good day. Bye now. to give another sincere thanks to Mr. Phil Hine for chatting with me. Uh, it, was a, it was amazing for me and I really hope we do it again. Uh, please purchase Hines Varieties and read enfolding.org. I'll have all those links in the show notes. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, and I'm terrible at, about this, uh, to subscribe to Prag Magic on YouTube or wherever pods are casted. Like, share, review. Any engagement helps. Leave a comment. Um, hopefully I saw you in the live chat and if you missed it and you only like listening, then the podcast will be available tonight wherever pods are casted. Uh, and uh, we the hallow.org where the article will be up with both this and the audio. Um, thank you all so much again. I hope you had a hairy horror day and it's something we always say in we the hallowed and that is to live on through art and ideas. So my friends, haunt them up. <laughs>